you're very welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Agenda item one is apologies. Can I ask members if you're aware of any apologies? Yes, Chair Daniel McCrossan sends his apologies. Okay, thanks for that, Justin. I think that's everyone else with us then. Okay, agenda item two, members, is chairperson's business. Uh, can I inform the committee that members met informally with Colin McGrath, MLA, and the British Heart Foundation, uh, Northern Ireland, on the background and purpose of his private member's bill to place a duty on the Department of Education for the mandatory provision of CPR training in post-primary schools. I think it's year eight to year 10 or year 12, Clark, I think it is, um, in Northern Ireland. And a note of the meeting will be provided at next week's meeting. But that was a positive engagement. Uh, I think there's some sound aspects to that proposal that is being made. Okay, then. Also, members, can I uh, advise you that interim guidance has been issued by the Department of Education on restraint and seclusion. Uh, the department will be briefing the Education Committee on this next week, and the committee uh, will debate the related motion that we've submitted uh, later this month as well. Uh, Robbie, I think there's the Business Committee made some indicative timing for the Education Committee Restraint and Seclusion motion, yeah? Has indeed. So basically, it's on the draft papers for the week after next on the Monday, a subject to executive business obviously coming in. If that's the case, if, if there's a large volume of executive business, it may push it, but it's likely to be on that Monday chair. That's great. Thanks for that. Okay, members, then agenda item three is draft minutes. Can I refer members to the draft minutes of the committee meeting? on the 5th of May at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising, which moves us to agenda item five and the Department of Education briefing on relationships and sexuality education in schools. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and add our witnesses? Can I refer members to Clark's brief? Our table pack. Can I just check everyone has access to the table papers? Okay. I think there was some issue earlier, but if anyone has any issue with that, if they could alert the clerk. Okay. Can I welcome then Karen McCulloch? the Director of Curriculum Qualifications and Standards Directorate at the Department of Education, Sam Dempster, Head of Curriculum and Assessment Team at the Department of Education, and Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Kingan, Head of School Improvement at the Department of Education. Can I advise officials that you will have 10 minutes to make your opening statement, followed by questions from members, uh, which can be answered from across your panel of witnesses. You're, you're very welcome, and thank you very much indeed for your briefing on this important matter today. Hi, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for the invitation to attend the committee today to talk about relationships and sexuality education, RSE, in the curriculum. And as you say, hopefully you've received your uh, the, a copy of the written briefing we've provided. Uh, so in my opening remarks today, I'll provide information about RSE in the context of the Northern Ireland curriculum, outline current delivery of RSE in our schools, highlight some of the resources and support currently available to schools, and finally look at the department's plans moving forward. So RSE is a mandatory element of the Northern Ireland curriculum for all pupils of compulsory school age. And the approach to delivery of RSE is similar to the approach across all areas of learning. Members will be aware that the statutory curriculum is designed to give schools as much flexibility as possible in what they choose to teach and to use approaches that best suit the needs of their pupils. The legal minimum content to be taught by schools is set out in statute as high levels of learning and below that are details of a range of areas which pupils should have the opportunity to explore. Within this context, as I've mentioned, it's a matter for teachers to decide how the curriculum should be delivered, which resources to use and which specific topics should be covered. Across the curriculum, there's a strong emphasis on preparing young people for life and work. 
This means developing both knowledge and understanding, but also requires a more explicit focus on developing the thinking skills and personal capabilities that young people increasingly need, not only in their learning, but also to deal with the challenges they face in their lives. RSE sits within that context. All publicly funded schools must cover RSE under the personal development and mutual understanding area of learning at primary level and under learning for life and work at post-primary level. Under PDMU, children should be enabled to explore a range of RSE issues, including, for example, their own and others' feelings and emotions, relationships with family and friends, their responsibilities to self and others, and how to sustain health, growth and well-being. In key stages three and four, the personal development element of LLW encompasses relationships, personal health and self-awareness. Pupils should continue to explore the qualities of relationships and develop their understanding about and strategies to manage the effects of change on body, mind and behaviour. There should also be opportunities to explore the implications of sexual maturation and the emotional, social and moral implications of sexual activity. Reflecting the curriculum design, schools and teachers are able to update and align curricular learning to reflect evolving societal requirements. For example, teachers can choose to deliver sensitive and important aspects of the curriculum at a time when they are the subject of national debate and when young people can make explicit connections between what they are learning in school and what is happening in the world. The flexibility of the curriculum encourages more innovative and customised approaches to ensuring our young people are both safe and well informed about the issues they face in modern society. Internationally, curriculum changes introduced in response to contemporary issues and which are based on detailed subject content often suffer from time lag between recognition, decision making, implementation and impact. The Northern Ireland curriculum has been specifically designed to prevent such problems. I would emphasise, however, that in RSE, as with all aspects of curriculum delivery, schools are held accountable for the quality of provision which they deliver, primarily through inspection. The autonomy and flexibility are coupled with appropriate accountability. The department requires all publicly funded schools to develop their own RSE policy, and in support of this, guidance has been produced which offers schools advice on how to develop and re review their policies, which were based on the ethos of the school and in best practice, subject to consultation with parents, pupils and governors. ETI, through its inspection, checks routinely whether a school has a current RSC policy, and its evaluation of safeguarding is based on the evidence of the whole range of related policies, including RSE. In 2015, the department commissioned ETI to carry out an evaluation of RSE. Many positives emerged, and some of those I would highlight include almost all of the lessons observed were good to outstanding. School leaders and teachers recognised the importance of the RSE programme. There was increasing development implementation of appropriate RSE policies and practices aligned to the ethos of individual schools. There were good links with a wide range of appropriate statutory and voluntary agencies and access to a wide range of age appropriate resources to support planning and enhance teaching. There were, of course, areas which required further development. Teaching of the more sensitive aspects of the, pro the programme was not always consistent. And at that time, some schools reported they did not have an RSE policy. And consultation and engagement with governors and parents was sometimes limited. ETI has provided a clear picture of what best practice looks like. An effective RSE, which is taught in a sensitive and inclusive manner, should provide children with opportunities to value themselves as unique individuals, respect themselves and others, begin to develop their own moral thinking and value systems, learn about healthy relationships and behaviour with others, and recognise and communicate their feelings and emotions and those of others. Importantly, an effective RSE policy is created as an integral part of a wider suite of curricular policies, as well as those for child protection, safeguarding and online safety. This helps to ensure that all aspects of the children's learning and wellbeing are provided in a holistic framework. To support schools in the delivery of the curriculum, SEER develops and produces curricular guidance and teaching support materials. These can be reviewed and updated to keep content relevant and contemporary. In August 2015, SEER published revised guidance on RSE for primary and post-primary schools, which, as I mentioned, provides advice on a broad range of issues. It also signposts 
schools to where they can access additional support, including a wide range of voluntary and community organisations who support schools in delivering aspects of the RSE curriculum. In 2018, in response to the ETI's evaluation and feedback from a variety of stakeholders, the department prioritised funding for SEA to review the range of RSE curriculum resources available to schools. The aim was for SEA to comprehensively review current resources and signpost schools to existing quality resources. In the areas where gaps were identified, SEA then developed new guidance and resources to support the teaching of sensitive issues. SEA was asked to develop new guidance in a number of priority areas. This included consent, what it means and its importance, developments in contraception, healthy positive self sexual expression and relationships, safe use of the internet, social media and its effects on relationships and self-esteem, LGBTQ plus matters, and domestic and sexual violence and abuse. In June 2019, this work led to the launch of a new online RSC hub to facilitate access to these resources. The RSC hub ensures that schools have access to a range of up-to-date, relevant resources and sources of support. SEA has worked closely with stakeholders to pilot resources with schools before they go live. Continued funding has facilitated the development of an RSC progression framework resources for children with special educational needs and resources related to menstrual well-being. The department's approach is aimed at providing teachers with resources and support to increase their competence and confidence in delivering RSE. It supports and enhances the teaching in schools without taking a mandatory or prescriptive one-size-fits-all approach. There has been positive feedback from a range of stakeholders on the work carried out by SEA to date. Going forward, um, we know that there is more work to be done and we will continue to support schools to further develop their RSE provision. The Minister has agreed further funding for RSE support and resources for the current financial year. The Department will work with SEA to identify and agree priorities going forward and this will include further work looking at professional development. As I've already mentioned, as part of the RSE hub, SEA is also producing a progression framework which will set out the resources and guidance materials for each key stage. A module of curriculum questions, including some on RSE, will be included in the omnibus, the school omnibus survey, which is, this was due to issue last term, but it's been deferred until September. And as we move back to inspection, we'll take the opportunity to identify good practice and develop and disseminate case studies of effective practice. Um, I think if that's okay, I'll stop there. Then Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to make those remarks and we're happy to answer any questions from members. Okay, thanks for those opening remarks. I'm sure we'll have a, a wide range of, of questions from members. Um, I'll not take up too much time initially, but just to ask perhaps the, the most uh, pertinent question, um, given that uh, RSE engages understanding uh, behaviour and consequences of a, of a really important nature, not least sexual safety, consent and freedom from bullying, should the Department of Education adopt a more prescriptive approach for this part of the curriculum, uh, including more standardised uh, RS relationship and sexuality education? Um, I think, as I mentioned there in those opening remarks, I mean, our, our position is that the way that our curriculum is set out works well for children. That minimum content is supported by those not that non-statutory guidance and resources. And I don't know, Suzanne, if you want to say a bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think all the evidence shows that providing mandatory content list uh, doesn't guarantee that a subject's taught well, that it improves delivery of provision. Quite the opposite, actually. All the international evidence says that curricular flexibility, um, given schools the opportunity to be flexible in terms of their delivery, to choose topics, to deliver them at times that's suitable for the school community, actually enhances delivery. That's our approach right across the curriculum in every area of learning. And uh, there's no real compelling evidence to say that RSE um, it would be appropriate to take a more prescriptive approach at this time. Um, the other thing is, in terms of prescription, if you move ahead to, to introduce prescriptive topics and issues that school communities aren't ready for, you can actually uh, get some very unfortunate situations, as we've seen right across the UK, where we've seen um, schools in conflict 
with parents and with governors. And, you know, our approach is really around improving uh, teaching and learning around it, supporting teachers to feel confident, to feel competent and to improve delivery in the classroom so that children are getting a better experience. Um, as, as Karen pointed out, the ETI have said um, almost every lesson they observed, you know, was very good or better. And um, there's no reason to suppose that children are getting a poor quality experience. Uh, Okay. Okay. The, the Education Committee has engaged with the Belfast Youth Forum in relation to its work and report on RSE entitled Any Use. Uh, and some, uh, I'd be good to know if the department has engaged with the group also. Um, we heard of some startling findings. For example, 60% of young people survey felt that the information they received in RSE was either not very useful or not useful at all. How would the department respond to that? Um, Chair, if I can come in on that. Um, yes, we have engaged with, with, with Belfast Youth Forum. Um, I attended a meeting recently with, with colleagues um, from our Inclusion and Wellbeing Directorate um, where they presented the findings of that report um, and we had a, a, a very useful discussion in and around that. Um, that was facilitated by Belfast uh, City Council. Um, so that, that engagement uh, continues. Um, I am aware that they are pressing very hard for uh, mandatory content and for upskilling of teachers. Uh, and that is something that we continue to, to look at. Yeah, I mean, I've, all children have a right to a quality teaching and learning right across the curriculum. And as I say, our approach is to try and um, make sure that the resources and supports are there to help teachers in delivering that. And as I say, one of the areas that's been developed on the hub is an area of support for teacher professional development. And we're going to continue with that this year. Yeah, and I think it's important to say, I mean, uh, that report, the experiences that a lot of those young people are reporting, it's very important to hear them and to understand them. But they predate quite a lot of the recent work around RSE, around the development of the hub, around the support and resources and as Karen highlights, you know, the recent focus on teacher professional learning. So um, it'll take time for some of that to have impact. And, you know, I think hearing more about young people from young people and their experiences is so important. And that we would hope, um, perhaps through the school omnibus survey, etc., to, um, you know, get more information about the impact that recent work over the last three, four five years has had. Um, on provision in schools. And Chair, I think okay. some of the feedback we got was um, around lack of awareness of the hub and what the hub can offer. So there probably is a piece of work for us to do there in terms of um, getting that message out there that the hub is useful and has very useful resources and links. Okay. I mean, just to be clear, the Belfast Youth Forum research was completed in September 2019, fairly recently. Yes. Um, uh, and the findings of the research were analysed in conjunction with Queen's University. Um, you mentioned this being a, a children's rights issue. I would agree. And again, the survey found that 52% of young people surveyed felt their right to RSE is not being met. Yeah, sure. I think the survey is, of course, recent. But if you look at the age range of the young people who took part in it, find that some of them are talking about their experiences that were you know a dozen years ago or half a sorry half a dozen years ago you know although the surveys recent you know the age range of the children and the young people uh goes up you know so they're not actually yeah. talking about current experiences age age breakdown of participants in the survey 14 7 percent 15 11 percent 16 20 percent 17 23 percent 18 15 percent over 18 is uh, approximately 25%, I think. Yeah. So you're talking, you know, almost half of those young people aren't statutory school age at, at present. Yeah, but you're, I mean, the key ages for relationship and sexuality education, surely? The, the key stages are three and four when they're, the children are statutory school age in terms of relationships and sexuality, education and the curriculum. Okay. 
And in terms of, you mentioned obviously the uh, minimum content order. Uh, can you update the committee with regards to what work the Department of Education is doing in conjunction with the Department of Justice to implement the, the Gillen review recommendations? Yeah, we, Chair, we are working with colleagues in the Department of Justice who they have, as you say, a lead responsibility for taking forward the recommendations set out in the Gillen report. And um, Sam is involved and uh, colleagues from Pupil Support I think, are part of the DOJ's Education and Awareness Working Group. So that's a cross-department multi-agency group established to raise awareness and education on issues highlighted in the review as well. Yeah, Chair, as, as Karen says, I, I'm, I'm part of the working group uh, with DOJ uh, looking at the, the Gillen recommendations uh, and particularly um, what we're, work we can take forward in, in respect of amending the minimum content order. Um, the, the only note of caution I would add there is we, we don't want to mend the orders so it actually narrows provision and schools focus on narrower issues. So we need to look at that carefully. We'll need to consult as well um, further down the line once we, we come to a conclusion. But there is, a, there is an education subgroup that has been set up uh, and I think the first meeting is the 19th of May um, in my diary. So we, we are taking that work forward. Okay. Sorry, yeah. the, Sorry go ahead. It was in direct response to the Gillen recommendations that the department commissioned SIA with consent as one of the issues to develop new guidance and resources. So, you know, that was in direct response to the initial findings of the Gillen report. So, um, you know, on the RSE hub, there's a significant section around consent and a uh, significant amount of resources that were developed in response to the Gillen findings. Okay, last question. I mean, how, how do we... How does the Department of Education monitor the extent to which the minimum content order and these resources are actually being implemented in schools? I think, I mean, if, I mean the primary source, well, schools do their own self-evaluation to inform their improvement of how they're doing things, but the, the primary source for us would be through inspection, and as you appreciate, that's been affected by action short of strike and COVID. Um, but we are moving back to you know, in inspection, and that will be an important source of information for us. And as we've mentioned already, there are questions um, going to be included on the school omnibus survey in September, which will allow us to gain more information. And I think it's important to emphasise as well that, you know, SEA worked very closely with schools to pilot the resources as they went live. Um, so there has been close work with stakeholders throughout the system um, in the development of the resources and appreciate your question is more about evaluation. Um, obviously there, ha there, there has been a pause in inspection and action short of strike has, infect has affected it prior to that. We hope that over the next couple of years we'll be in the position to get a clearer picture of uh, the current nature of RSE provision in our schools. When, when you say there's been a, a pause in, in inspection uh, and I need to get a clearer picture, what what is the the date of your current picture on RSE in schools? Well, the primary school survey dates from twenty fifteen. And and the primary school survey and, and what about post primary? Uh, I, I think it's twenty thirteen. The primary school or the post primary survey. So, the extent of your understanding of the RSE provision in our schools in post-primary dates back to 2013? Not the extent of our understanding. The last time that there was a thematic survey of RSE, um, it wasn't possible to undertake that during the period of action short of strike. And, um, you know, inspections paused due to the COVID-19 situation. That doesn't mean we haven't had extensive engagement with stakeholders, discussions with stakeholders, both ourselves and SIA, in regard to provision. But if you're asking about a thematic survey, they're the dates of a thematic survey across the system. Okay, many more questions I need to bring colleagues in. So I'll bring in Deputy Chairperson Pat Shane, MLA, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say the picture uh, is anything but clear in a very important aspect of our children's educations uh, in, in school. Uh, I'm not 
I'm going to ask any questions. Um, Nicola is going to take the lead for us on this particular issue. But uh, I would just say, Chair, I mean, your line of questioning has exposed the weaknesses uh, overall in this uh, particular aspect of education. And I think it's something we need to keep a focus on. But I'm, I'm going to leave it to Nicola to ask questions for us. OK, thank you. You're on mute, Chris. Sorry, thanks, Pat. Um, sorry, I was just saying, content to bring in uh, Nicola Brogan, MLA, given the approach that you're taking in that regard. Nicola? Thanks very much, Chair, and thank you, Pat, for that. And thanks to the three of you for um, your evidence here this morning. Um, I think I'll pick up actually exactly where um, the Chair left off. Um, so can I just confirm that the last thematic review on post-primary um, RSE was 2013? Yeah, I'll get the exact date for you. Um, from memory, it's 2013. So the, the point I'd like to make there then is um, I also want to pick up on the any use report that we, um, the briefing we received from the Belfast Youth Forum. It was in January of this year. Um, and the evidence that and um, statistics we received that the chair has already outlined some of them. Um, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll outline, a, outline a few more. Half of the um, children and young people that were surveyed think that their right to RSA currently isn't being met. 34% of the young people surveyed um, said they'd never received um, an RSA lesson in school. And of the young people who did receive RSA, only 10% said that the information that they received was useful. Now, that was um, evidence was provided to us this year, in January 2021, in a briefing. So I, I don't think that that should be overlooked in any way whatsoever. Um, it, we also received... Um, we discussed this with the Children's Commissioner, who also recommended that um, changes need to be made, needed to be made to RSE curriculum, that it should be mandatory and standardised. From the any use report, the recommendations that um, was made at that stage was that um, Sia and yourself should be working alongside young people to co to co produce RSE um, in, within the curriculum, and that. RSE should be taught by specialised, qualified and trained staff. So would you agree with me that without a modern, standardised and mandatory approach to RSE, that we are in fact letting our children and young people down? Yeah, Nicola, I think it's important to say RSE is mandatory within the curriculum. There's no question that it's not mandatory, both um, within PDMU and LLW. Um, relationships and sexuality education is mandatory, so I don't want there to be, you know, any misunderstanding about the fact that it's not mandatory. As well, in terms of standardised, there is a legal minimum that's standard that has to be provided, and I, I, I just want to give you some insight into what the legal minimum is. You know, children must have opportunities to explore the qualities of relationships, to explore the qualities of loving, respectful relationships to deal, develop coping strategies, to deal with challenging relationship scenarios, to explore the implications of sexual maturation, to explore the emotional, social and moral implications of early sexual activity. They also have to investigate the influences on physical and emotional and personal health, develop understanding about and strategies to manage the effects of change on body, mind and behaviour, investigate the effects of on the body of legal and illegal substances, develop preventative strategies in relation to accidents in home and school, develop strategies to promote personal safety. They have to explore <laughs> personal morals, values and beliefs, uh, investigate the differing influences on young people and explore the different ways to develop self-esteem. So that's, that's a key stage three. There's different statutory requirements at uh, foundation, key stage one, key stage two and key stage four but they're similar and age appropriate. So I, I don't want there to be any doubt there is an RSE curriculum. It is a standard minimum that all children must receive legally, the same as in every single area of learning right across the curriculum, and it is mandatory. Well, can you explain to me then why 34% of these young people said they didn't receive any RSE? Like those are the stats that we've received. So I, it may... I, I understand that, and I understand that sometimes as RSE is delivered as part of learning for life and work, it might not, 
you know, a young person might not explicitly uh, feel they've received a specific RSE class as such. Um, the fine, I don't want to downplay, however, the importance of the findings and the important of young, importance of young people's voice, because it is very worrying, of course, that young people said that. However, um, what I can say is from a legal perspective, it is mandatory, it is standardised, it is there. Schools develop, it's flexible that schools develop experiences beyond that in the same way as they do in English and maths and history and geography, it's there. Well, to my understanding, the fact that um, there is that flexibility means that schools can kind of pick and choose according to their ethos um, exactly what parts of the RSE curriculum they wish to teach. So I'm not sure that's not the kind of standardised approach that I think is necessary. And that's a point I want to make clear. Um, I will move it along to another um, important point in the Assembly a few weeks back um, debated a motion on the violence against women and girls strategy and um, it was supported by all parties that we need, a, we need a strategy to tackle that and one of the main points from that debate was again the need for improved mandatory and standardised relationship and sexuality education. Um, it was highlighted that we need to promote um, healthy sex and healthy relationships um, with uh, with our young people so that they um, it, we can tackle gender violence. So I think it's all well and good um, that there's a review going into the content around consent and sexual consent and sexual violence and contraception. But if the if the curriculum and um, the teaching isn't mandatory and standardised and we're not um, engaging with religious groups and faith groups, then it's simply not good enough. So can you tell me what engagement the department um, is doing with, um, uh, what engagement full stop they're doing about delivering RSE um, to complement the violence and against women and girls strategy, please? Well, well through another part of the department, we're contributing to the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence and Abuse Strategy, which is being led by the Department of Health and Department of Justice. And um, officials are working with the, both of those departments to progress actions in relation to education and awareness, including all areas of the RSE and preventative education. And also in terms of, as you mentioned there, in terms of curriculum content, um, at each of the stages that we've talked about foundation stage key stage one two three and four there are opportunities to to build that into the curriculum you know through that that's the statutory requirements that are are set out so for example even at foundation stage there you know pupils are to be given opportunities to explore their own and others feelings and emotions how to keep safe in familiar and unfamiliar environments and how to respond appropriately to conflict situations you know right through to uh, key stages three and four, where young people are exploring issues of relationships, um, which include exploring the qualities of loving and respectful relationships, developing co coping strategies, which deal with challenging relationship scenarios, and how to avoid and resolve conflict. And then run alongside that, I'd say, other resources that are available on the hub and signposting that schools can use to support the teaching of those issues. So that's the approach that- Yeah, and, yeah Nicola, I mean, the Minister has agreed further funding for the development of uh, materials for 2021, 20, 22, um, and we will be commissioning CA to do work on that. So there is an opportunity there for us to engage in those issues that you, that you have raised as well. Yeah. Yeah, just... That's good because I, th I believe, the feeling I get is despite what you are rhyming off there in the list of what you're going to do, the reality and the feeling on the ground is that it's not being delivered in the schools. And I think the um, that report to the NAU report really highlighted that. So um, I, I do think it's time that this needs to really to be looked at. As, as Pat has already said, this is left with kind of more questions and answers here this morning, to be honest. Um, the final question I want to ask you is about um, teacher training. Um, and what the department has done to ensure that teachers have got the knowledge and skills to actually confidently deliver um, the like of um, RSE. Well, well, Nicola, in terms of um, initial teacher education, if we, if we can start there, uh, teachers are taught um, when they're doing their BA, for example, they're, they're taught to teach the curriculum uh, and every aspect of the curriculum, if it's maths, English, RSE, or, or whatever. So that, that, that happens from... Um, day one of their initial teacher education. Um, in terms of 
uh, teaching professional learning. Um, I, mean, I think that really comes from the, the, the top of the school uh, and goes back to uh, the school development plan. Um, I think RSE, as with other subjects, has to be valued uh, and there has to be leadership um, you know, from the school in terms of making it a, a priority. Um, I agree. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Nicola, um, having taken forward the work with SEO over the last number of years, you know, teacher professional learning is an area that we're conscious of. Uh, we initially focused on, on the project with SEA in terms of resources, but in terms of the work going forward, we do definitely want to look at, you know, further opportunities in terms of teacher professional learning. There, there is quite a lot of work around this in terms of, for example, um, the sexual health team in Belfast Health and Social Care Trust, they provide quite a comprehensive RSE training program for schools. And we know that since 2013, two thirds of our post-primary schools have, have participated in what is a full two day training course. And actually a full third of our, of our post-primary schools have taken part in the whole school training. So I think those figures are really encouraging. And they are specialists with specialist expertise and knowledge in that area. Um, we also know, for, for example, um, in terms of the NSPCC and the work that the department's commissioned from them around the Keeping Safe program, again, quite significant capacity building in primary school around issues such as neglect and um, you know, child sexual exploitation and things like that, and around how, how to teach that in a, a confident manner in the curriculum. So quite a bit of capacity building has taken place. Um, we we'll want to have a look at how we can bring it forward um, over the next financial year. And one of the things is how we encourage those schools with really good practice to share that practice and to support others where perhaps you know practice hasn't been as well developed in the past. So that's something we need to look at about sharing best practice, giving RSE a real high profile in, term, in terms of teacher professional learning. Obviously over the last year with COVID, um, there's been a big focus on continuity of the curriculum and on remote learning and how we ensure that children are getting the minimum in uh, the core, you know, those really core areas of the curriculum. But I think now with schools back to face-to-face -face teaching, there, there is a fantastic opportunity to focus on that over the next year. Okay. Um, thanks very much for that. And uh, you're right, that is encouraging, but I think that's one, um, another area that we really need to focus on when, um, updating RSE curriculum um, is about teacher training. It can't be that teachers who specialize in religion or English or something else are expected to then take up um, this part of it as well. It's too important and it needs to be specialized. But thanks very much to the three of you for your time. And thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks, Nicola. Officials, just just briefly, just to build on, on some of the, the questioning, um, you, you said that um, the provision of RSE in schools was last thematically reviewed and evaluated in, in 2013. Is, is that acceptable? Is that safe? Well, it said post-primary schools for 2013, Chair. Post-primary schools. schools. Okay, I mean, post-primary schools. Is that acceptable? Is that safe? How, how does that measure against the, what, you would, what you would like to do? Well, I think... Um, over the last number of years, um, inspection activity generally has been significantly impacted by action short of strike and over the last year by COVID. Um, that means we don't have the rich body of inspection evidence that we would like to have, but that's, it's, that, there is a reason for that. It, it was action short of strike and it, it did have a significant impact on inspection. And what's the consequences of that for the, the provision in an area of this importance. Are you concerned? I, th I think it's it's not a matter of being concerned because the, the thematic inspection in 2015 identified many, many positives. It wasn't a thematic report that came out with huge, that raised huge issues around the teaching of RSE in schools. In fact, when it looked at individual lessons, um, you know, all, all the lessons observed, uh, I think, from memory, were very good or better. There was lots of good practice in terms of 
um, how schools were approaching this. So it wasn't the thematic survey that led us to think this is an area of, of urgency or crisis. And I think okay. building, on that, building on that, when since then there has been revised guidance that's gone out to schools, primary and post-primary schools. The, re the resources have all been reviewed, and that's done in conjunction with stakeholders and f feedback okay. from schools. And, and has the has the minister commissioned an updated thematic review? Well, inspections pause, Chair, due to COVID at present. Um, it'll be a matter for the minister to decide in conjunction with um, ETI when inspection resumes. It's a, it's paused at present. It was considered that with schools having to deal with so much during COVID and all all the associated difficulties that schools have had to face that actually inspection would place too much of a burden on our teaching staff and our school leaders at this time. Okay, let me bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please, thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, can I thank Karen, uh, Sam and Suzanne for giving up their time this morning to meet with us. I should say I have every confidence in the professionalism of our teachers to deliver uh, the content uh, as outlined. And indeed, this committee has expressed over this past uh, many, many months uh, confidence, even to the extent that uh, the work of the teachers could be taken into account in the measurement of exam results. So I pay compliment to the teachers and their ability to deliver against the curriculum. I've only a few questions, uh, Chair. Um, uh, and maybe if I kind of read the questions out and then the team can respond uh, how, how, they, how they feel uh, equipped. <clears throat> can I just ask you about um, any variations across the schools or indeed within the school sectors? Um, ask about the issue around where homeschooling is, is taking place and this being an essential part of the curriculum and then also into where the independent schools uh, operate and again this being uh, a part of the, the, the curriculum and really uh, trying to understand where best practice is and where best practice is taken from as you further develop the RSE and the committee has taken a great interest in children who are perhaps on the um, very well difficulties in their homes, registered uh, uh, as being on social services, and any feedback around how this subject helps with uh, monitoring of, of difficult situations in parental homes. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked about there the variation across schools and everything, and I think that was something that was recognised you know, from the feedback from the ETI evaluation, um, that there was a lack of uniformity and that some schools may require more support in delivering you know, a contemporary RSE provision, which meets the needs of, of uh, their other pupils. To, so to address that gap, that's why we asked SIA to, um, to update you know, all the relevant resources and supports, and they were commissioned to carry out a review of their existing guidance and resources and to identify and signpost, you know, and develop new guidance that would support teachers. And then that, so there were some specific topics that were reviewed and looked at, and then we moved towards uh, the hub were being launched so that that can be kept up to date and, as I say, contemporary and relevant with the, with the resources um, being readily available and anybody can access those you know to support the teaching and learning i don't know Suzanne, if you want to pick up yeah, on the other I issues mean, yes of course there karen's quite right there there was variation in provision particularly around the, the teaching of the more sensitive aspects of the curriculum i think it's a fair comment to say there's variation in teaching and learning and in the provision between schools in every area of the curriculum we all know some schools are outstanding have outstanding provision across all areas of learning other schools require more support. That's the point and purpose of inspection and accountability and uh, of the self-evaluation and improvement process that we support those schools that need support, that those schools, who have strong systems for self-evaluation uh, and improvement work to improve that 
and also that we provide s support and additional guidance and uh, resources for those schools who already have outstanding practice so they can continue to have outstanding practice. So in that respect, I don't think RSE is particularly different from any other area of learning across the curriculum. Um, but it, say it is a process of improvement, of support. I think the biggest single thing that we can do to help improve RSE provision is to ensure the teachers have the confidence and the capacity and the information that they need to develop a comprehensive program and to, to feel that they're confident in delivering it to young people. And um, in terms of your, your question, just to pick up on then, if that's okay, around the independent schools, um, we can provide the committee with more information on that, but just in a general sense, independent schools aren't required to deliver the Northern Ireland curriculum. So the things that we're talking about in terms of the statutory minimum content for RSE don't apply to independent schools, the same as the statutory minimum doesn't apply in every other area of learning. However, when it when they do register, ETI does look at their safeguarding policies and approaches to make sure that there's an appropriate framework in place uh, to keep young people in those schools safe um, in the school environment and that, you know, for example, they, there, there is a designated uh, teacher for safeguarding, etc. So there is a safety check there around that. In terms of curricular provision and teaching and learning, it, those schools don't deliver the Northern Ireland curriculum, so there is, there is a difference there between um, grant-dated schools and independent schools. Um, okay. Robin, I think you made a very important point um, at your opening remarks when you when you talked about teachers and the quality of teaching and, and, and their ability to deliver um, RSE in schools uh, and the flexibility in the curriculum supports that. Um, the approach we've taken, we take supports that. Um, in terms of RSE in schools and across school sectors, that will very much depend on the ethos of the school. Um, and each school is required to have its own policy in respect of RSE. Uh, which reflects the views of governors and parents and, and indeed. And it's really important that um, RSE, there is a partnership approach with parents in particular, that uh, the parents have an awareness of the policy, of the approach to RSE in school, and that there is a joint understanding of how things will be taken forward. And I think that's something actually in Northern Ireland that we are very good at. Uh, and we haven't seen any of the unfortunate scenes that we've seen elsewhere in the UK where we have parents at war with schools or anything like that. You know, we haven't got scenarios like that. We have good, strong schools with good, strong relationships with the wider school community. Could, could you perhaps just address the issue around where children are on the at-risk register, where there may be family difficulties and so on? Has RSE a role to play in that area? I, th I think, um, Robin, not specifically in terms of that. That would be in terms of the school's uh, monitoring processes and all, all of that. And they will have, I'm not an expert on that area, um, but you know they will have their policies and procedures. Where RSE um, can help right across the curriculum in terms of um, is creating a, an inclusive and respectful environment where children feel their views and uh, opinions are listened to, that what they have to say is important. So, you know, a good quality curriculum in RSE works hand in hand with good policies around bullying, around safeguarding, around children's rights, about children's voice. So the two do go hand in hand. In terms of a very specific role, no, but in terms of building that inclusive and respectful environment uh, where children feel that it's a safe space for them to express their views, uh, to understand that there's an appropriate adult to talk to, yes, of course, good quality RSE provision makes a really important contribution and a really important contribution as well that no child feels uncomfortable in terms of, of delivery of RSE. Okay, Robin. Okay. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank, thanks for that, Robin. Um, and th thanks for those answers. I, I am unfortunately aware of at least one school where there have been difficulties in relation to RSE policy uh, and disputes uh, between parents and governors. Um, so it is clear that it is an issue that is going to need to be uh, reformed and ironed out further. 
Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, please? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that's me unmuted there. So thank you for your presentation, guys. And there's been some really good questions. And to be fair, a number of the members have asked some of my questions. I've only got two, Chair, so I'll not take too much time. Um, the, the Chair actually referred to the, the, the last review date, so 2013-2015. And, and I'm not going to critique them. I'm just going to suggest that given the, the, the speed of development of social media and the use of social media, um, that we need to be um, much more proactive in terms of um, of the review process and, and any changes that need to be made. And thinking of one issue in particular, and that is uh, image-based sexual abuse. Um, so that's a, a very prevalent uh, issue for some young people uh, today uh, in 2021. Um, and with regard to the protections of children um, and that internet-based problem um, and the, the the availability, accessibility of pictures, uh, whether they be indecent or just um, uh, even even holiday pictures and stuff, I'm aware that there's some issues with some school-aged children at the moment uh, who are being sex exploited. Uh, based on that, is there anything that can be done uh, in the short term, or is that an issue that is being looked at at the moment, guys? Um, Robbie, as the, you mentioned that the reviews there, you know, the last evaluations 2013, 2015, but you know there is work ongoing all the time, and we'd, I'd would mention there, you know, is asking uh, CIA to review. The, and update resources and specifically um, in 2018-19 there were resources developed around internet and social media issues and I think you mentioned their domestic sexual abuse. Uh, sorry, no, it wasn't, it wasn't domestic, it was Im image-based um, sexual oh, abuse. Yes, yeah, just to be clear. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, but there, there were resources developed around that, particularly as you say around the social media um, issues um, <clears throat> and then and then those are available on the hub. And I think the thing about the hub is when the resources are on there, they can be constantly reviewed and updated. So, you know, when things do come into the media or are recommended in, re in um, reviews, there is a quick way of updating. You know, if you go back to legislation, that's going to take time. But this is actually ongoing and live and can be kept very contemporary and relevant to what's available. So if there are links available, new resources become available, you know, they can be... Uh, made available to all schools via that hub. And I mean, and as I said, when the it's quite high quality resources that are put on there, they're developed, you know, in conjunction with practitioners and relevant say, health professionals or experts in an area. Yeah. And then they're piloted before they're put onto the hub. Yeah. Um, safe okay. use of the internet is, sorry, I was just gonna say, Robbie, safe use of the internet is a particular theme that the hub uh, has developed that wide range of resources on, as Karen said. So it's just to you know really emphasise that th that was recognised as a particularly important issue, and that one that schools have to deal with in terms of outside the curriculum, in terms of their policies and procedures, because significant incidents obviously do arise. So you know the two do go hand in hand, and I think you know we have tried to keep that very contemporary and up to date, and update what's available there for, in terms of support for schools. Yeah, I think as I mentioned in those opening remarks as well you know a, an effective RSE policy is created as part of a, a wider suite of policies you know including those for child protection safeguarding and online safety you know they should fit together it's like connected yeah. across the school it's a great well, frame, framework I, I hope I'm not sort of overstepping the bounds of, of, of uh, the competency um, of this but so, so I know this is more about the curriculum and, that, and that's grand but certainly when I draw on my experience from Preventing harm, whether that would be in road traffic accidents or fires, there's there's a, there's a, there's things that we can do to prevent harm from actually arising and, and making people aware of the dangers. And one of those would be communication with those social media platforms, be it Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, and all of those type of things. Um, so in, in terms of, I know this is about education and information, but is there anything being done um, to you know, you know that these are these are um, global conversations with regard to you know where this information and stuff particularly with regard to image-based sexual abuse. Is there, any, is there any feedback going back the other way to try and prevent this from actually being a problem rather, just, rather than just informing pupils of, of the dangers? I, Robbie, I think it's not one that we in the Department of Education have taken forward, you know, any direct discussion with those sort of providers. Um, it might be one I think, you know, the executive as a whole might want to have a look at in, term, yeah. in terms yeah. of it. Um, it's not, say, it's, it's not one we have taken forward, but 
prevention is very much the focus in terms of the curriculum, right. you know, in terms of prevention of the incidents happening uh, yeah. rather than yeah. dealing with the aftermath and really trying right from primary school um, to make sure that children have a really good understanding of how to use the internet safely and the things that can potentially go wrong um, in terms of the internet. You know, it's a great tool for young people. It offers so much opportunity, but there are so many risks as well for young people. It's so important to educate them. So prevention is the curricular focus, absolutely. But in terms of direct discussion with uh, providers, not from the Department of Education, uh, other government departments might have taken forward some of that work. Okay, guys, I have just one, one last question, um, if that's okay. So in the previous presentation um, on best practice in RSE, the department said that an important pillar um, for RSE should be the involvement of external agencies and guest speakers um, to deliver the content. So what thought has been given to having representation from community and voluntary uh, sector groups, for instance, to tackle issues such as stigma with regard to HIV and that type of things using groups like uh, Positive Life or... Um, uh, from my perspective, thinking about groups that would, um, rather than sort of sexual education in terms of um, protections about abstention, actually, um, because when I've spoken to young, uh, you know, groups with young people, and they're very candid in terms of um, what the habits are and what actually happens, it's definitely it's not the, it's not the way it was back in my day and in, in, in the olden days, as they would say. Things things are different, um, and 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 even you know. Uh, underage sexual activity. Let's be honest; it, it, it's 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 very prevalent. And whilst education is good, there has to be, for me, there would have to be that room for people who would try and promote abstention. As because uh, if we talk about prevention, there's nothing there's nothing will prevent the dangers and, and exploitation better than than abstention. Yeah, Robbie, I think um, you know it's an important point you make, and absolutely, um, external agencies, voluntary and community agencies can really bring an added depth to the RSE provision because they have that specialist expertise and knowledge. And children do respond very well as well, sometimes to a different face. They feel more comfortable maybe having those discussions not with the class teacher at times. So, you know, really important role. It's not an area where the department would want to be prescriptive. You know, we aren't going to identify um, you should have this group or that group. Schools are really well placed to identify um, groups that have expertise and knowledge on issues that they're dealing with at the relevant time. SEAS Hub signpost resources that are developed by a range of agencies again, so that's a, a repository of information that's there for schools if there is an issue um, where they're looking for more support or an external agency. But I don't think it's a path that we, that we as a department would want to go down because it's like anything else. You give a list of recommendations or providers, you inevitably, without meaning to, leave really important and really good provision out. And things change. So keeping that up to date, you know, would be difficult. Schools are well placed um, to decide which external agencies will come in. Um, I think there there is, of course, um, a, a place for teaching around contraception and all, all the different ways of keeping children safe that way. And also for some schools in a faith-based context around abstinence or even in a not in a faith-based context, well, just more generally, you know. I mean, that is, you know, all of those approaches. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. The, yeah. They're um, appropriate. All those approaches are completely appropriate. Okay, Suzanne, well, this is the final one. And I wasn't going to ask one, but I'll, I'll, I'll just take this final one. So if we take if we take the approach of that it's not a, a common curriculum type thing and then and I get that risk assessment approach I really really do guys because if you're talking to children um, in a country setting with just a few pupils as a talk talking to a school in the city of Belfast where you, and, and mixed schools as in boys and girls and whatever that that's all slightly different so the territory slightly different. However, how do you measure the effectiveness of each individual school? So taking that approach may be the right way of doing it, but what is the outcome measurement to say, well, this is the right approach? So you can take that approach and that's, that's fine, but how do you measure the effectiveness of that um, and, and, and the measurable outputs? Um, yeah. Do you get that? Yeah. So like in, in an individual school inspection, ETI will look at the quality of curriculum implementation. And I know there's been a lot of discussion this morning about the impact of action short of strike and of, of COVID. But as we get back to a more normal pattern of inspection, you know, each individual inspection will look at the quality of curriculum implementation. And that has to include RSE. Then more widely across the system, what we want to do is identify strengths and weaknesses across the system. And that's what a thematic inspection that we're talking about does. doesn't look necessarily 
in depth at an individual institution, but it looks across, it gets a picture, a snapshot across the whole system. So there's a role for both. There's a role at looking at individual schools and how we make sure that they're, they're effective and also taking a snapshot. Last time when we had the recommendations from ETI, that brought our work with SEA around the hub and the new resources. If a future thematic inspection identifies further areas for improvement, then you know we'll work through an action plan and, and deliver that. So there's a number of ways that we, we can take that forward and, and do that work in terms of improving. Um, you know, I think it's wrong to say that very detailed subject prescription um, in legislation leads to standardised practice. It doesn't. Mm -hmm. That's a mistaken concept yeah. because there's always variation in the quality of teaching. So you can give 100 teachers the same list. They won't all deliver it the same way. You know, so, you know, that it's not a direct link. There is no such thing as standardised practice. But in Northern Ireland, we have really well qualified teachers with really good schools. And, you know, provision is good. Okay, thank you so much, and thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Hey, Robbie, thank, thank, thank you. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA, please? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, folks, and thank you very much for your time and, and contribution this morning. Um, I'm a governor in two schools, and can I just can I just perhaps expand on the question? Most of the questions I, I wanted to ask have been taken, but I just wanted, in terms of the, where the chair mentioned there about disputes between parents and governors, um, what more support can be given to governors in that context? Um, I think that, I mean, as part of the process that schools go through each year, I, and, and I appreciate the point you're making, you know, um, when it's the responsibility of Board of Governors of each school to ensure that there is a comprehensive programme of RSE is delivered. But a really important part of developing that is that it should, you know, everything has to be done in consultation. So the Board of Governors need to make sure that in, in developing it, they, they, there has been consultation with parents, with the governors themselves, and that with the young people in the school. And then moving forward, when something's implemented, um, each year there is, like, there is a process of self-evaluation within the school and looking at what, what which areas need further development and support and then if there is an area which requires that then it's for the you know to find out where those supports are available yeah and there is an important safeguard there in terms of the right of withdrawal you know if an individual parent doesn't want their child to participate in rse that is their right and yeah. you know there is a safeguard there in terms of a, a governors and their negotiation with parent, an individual parent, you know, if all that consultation has been carried out, a program has been developed that is, you know, the majority of parents, the vast majority of parents have bought into, there is that individual right of withdrawal for an individual parent if they're uncomfortable with the provo proposed content. And, you know, that is there as a safeguard in terms of relationships. I think also, uh, as, as they develop their resources, uh, it is important that they engage with boards of governors. Um, to get that buy-in, so the boards of governors understand what, what the purpose of the resources are, uh, what they're designed to achieve, uh, and that they sit comfortably with the school's ethos. So there, there, there is, there is uh, work there to be done in and around engagement with boards of governors. Yeah. The policy is the key document. You know, the boards of governors obviously aren't involved in the day-to-day -day teaching, but the policy sets out the school's approach, and that should be reflective of the agreed approach of the school leadership team and the governors together. I suppose the question I'm asking, though, is if policy is followed, training is is, is um, taken, procedures are follow, followed and consultation happens, and we reach the point where there's a dispute, what further help, assistance, protections, guidance, or, is there, or whatever, if we get to the point of a dispute, is there for governors? As a governor in two schools, you know, um, I think I think governors will need that, not just on this issue, but on a whole range of issues. You know, yeah. I, mean, can, I, I can, think can, it's fair can, to say there is support there for governors, both through, uh, primarily through the education authority. You know, there's a range of support, and we can provide the committee with more detail about the support. It wouldn't be yeah. our particular, you know, area of expertise in terms of governor support and training, but you know, there there is a support system there. I think. And, I think, you know, I think in practice. I think in practice, having been a governor for some time in schools, the support that governors get from time to time from the EA 
will at least be a mixed bag. We'll just leave it at that. Um, in terms of the the um, in practice, what you know, what is the difference in terms of how this applies? Uh, uh, to a state school as opposed to a faith-based school? Is, is, there, is there a difference, really, in, in practice? Um, the curriculum's the same. There are uh, all school sectors that you might describe as faith-based, the Catholic maintained sector, um, the control, then the controlled sector, Irish medium sector, voluntary grammar, secondary, um, they all deliver the Northern Ireland curriculum. So that minimum content that I was talking about earlier applies to every grant dated school in Northern Ireland, regard, regardless of sector or school type. So the, the differences may come on building on that minimum and on the particular focus. So that minimum's there, all the schools have to deliver it. And um, it may be um, that particular schools take, you know, a particular approach to certain themes, certain issues, topics, um, dependent on what their school community and their wider school ethos is. But is the department aware that in practice it differs between the, what could be deemed a state school and a faith-based school? We haven't any particular evidence around, you know, we haven't, it's not something we've looked at in terms of inspection, the difference in practice between different school types. It's not something we have a strong evidence base around or that we've looked at in particular. Would it, would, would it not be, um, given that we have a number of different um, types of school in Northern Ireland, in my view too many, but a number of different types of schools in Northern Ireland, um, would that not be something which would be a useful piece of work to, to, to be done? Yeah, I think it would be. And, you know, it's it's something, as I say, as inspection takes place again in the future, you know, if there is a thematic inspection, it's certainly something we could draw out, particularly if it's a matter of interest to the committee. Yeah, and I think, yeah. I mean, as, as you say, as part of inspection of child protection safeguarding, you know, the ETI would routinely assess whether a schools have an appropriate policy for delivery of RSC. And, um, you know, as then as part of an, an inspection, when, when they're up and running, they also assess the outworkings of the policy, you know, through discussions with, with groups of learners as well so those issues can be pulled out about yeah. not only what's there but what's actually been delivered okay um thank you thank you very much indeed all of you thanks chairman thanks william I, I think william draws out some important points there um and in response to your reference the right of parents uh, to withdraw um what what if parents are actually concerned about the adequacy of a, a board of governors rse policy and, and content what what is the the framework for dispute resolution in that regard yeah so there's curriculum complaints chair in terms of any area of the curriculum um a parent can raise a complaint first to the principal then directly to the board of governors and ultimately the ea has a curriculum complaints tribunal which can be convened so rse is no different from any other area of the curriculum if you're if a parent raises a complaint or uh, an issue around curricular provision there there's an established pro complaints process for that to go through for matters okay. to do with the curriculum okay that's that's helpful what what what's a potential outcome of an ea curriculum complaints tribunal in terms of affecting change um the, the tribunal can direct the school to take a particular course of action so if um, they find against the school for example uh, they can require the the school to change you know, what, what, what it's been doing to that point, uh, and that okay. is binding. I think it's fair okay. to say it's not a, you know, it's it's not a frequent situation yeah. where matters would get to that stage yeah. where, uh, you know, that tribu a tribunal would have to direct a school in a particular manner. Again, I know, I know you've referenced uh, areas of dispute, but generally these things have been worked through by school communities. Yeah, and hopefully it'll okay. be part of the process of developing a policy is, is a really important element, is engagement with parents. So hopefully those issues are sorted out at the point they're arising. But as I say, there is a process there. Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA, please? Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Suzanne, for your evidence this morning. Um, very important line of question by my uh, committee colleagues already, so many of the questions that I wanted to raise have already been asked, so thank you to my colleagues for that. Um, 
Can you give me some more information on the piece around personal morals, values and beliefs? That, I mean, that is covered as part of the, the requirements, um, you know, the statutory minimum requirements, that this is to be something that is um, lo looked at as part of um, PDMU and LLW. But I think as well, it's not only within that. I think there's a really important part about how that's connected across other areas of the curriculum as well. But, yeah, it is specifically referenced. Yeah, just yes, at, at T stage three, for example, um, on the topic of self awareness, uh, people are given an opportunity to explore their self awareness, and, and they're provided with opportunities to consider the importance of self confidence, self esteem, um, and how that impacts on physical and emotional mental health throughout their life. And that does that does cover areas, um, you know, the sense of their self. Uh, explores explores uh, personal morals, values, and beliefs. Uh, looks at influences on the young people. Um, and explores different ways to develop self-esteem. So it is, it's part of a, a sort of a rounder um, area of learning. Okay. Um, right, I'm not getting any any detail on that, so I'll not probe it further. Um, Justin, we could provide you, I mean, see, I have developed specific resources around that, the support skills, and if it's helpful, um, you know, clearly ourselves, we're not practitioners, so, you know, our, our detail on that, it, it, you know, it isn't probably great, but we what we can provide you with is copies of the specific resources around self-awareness and around, you know, uh, those issues within the curriculum, we can provide you some links to those, if that's helpful. Okay, I think I think it's, it's all, so a lot of this is oriented around the children's morals, values, and beliefs, and that is got at home. Most of that is taught, taught and learned at home, but it could be supplemented at school and help uh, help children guide them in terms of their own awareness and knowledge of that, um, and that will then uh, guide their behaviours. Um, did you see Newsnight last night? Any of you? No. no. Um, it was disturbing viewing last night and, and touching on what Robbie has already said in relation to how things have moved on from 2013 and from 2015. Um, technology has changed um, and I have no idea about the technology that young people are now uh, using and are now um, easy with, but uh, things that can be done over social media now to, to uh, which can then put those children who send those messages or, or write something down in a, in a moment's uh, Thoughtlessness, and next thing they're brand, the next thing they're, they're, they're not alone if they caused an awful heartache for the people that they're, they're targeting, um, but they may have damaged themselves irrevocably for the future. Um, and I think that's such an important piece of this in terms of the education. Um, it, the last night, you know, they talked about it was across the water, it was, it was focused on, but they looked at sexism, misogyny, and sexual harassment, which was rampant in primary schools. Um, which was frightening. So um, I would just be concerned that it would be the same over here. I'd be really concerned by that. Um, and the monitoring and inspection piece that you've told us about being only in 2013, 2015, for the last time that happened for both primary and, and post-primary, that's, that's worrying to say the least. Um, and on, on the piece that, that Robin Newton's discussed, you know, those, those looked after children, those children who are at risk, I want this is um, something that maybe concerns me. Those children don't have the, the moral compass from home. They don't know, they haven't been taught you know, what's right and wrong necessarily from home or from, from another source. And they're not, they're not necessarily getting it at school because the sense I'm getting is that this is an optional extra almost within some school environments. Um, is it negligence that those children are not being taught this vital, vitally important subject? I think, Justin, you would struggle to go into a school, um, a primary school in Northern Ireland, and not find that they've set out values for the school community and for individual children. Our schools are fantastic at the promotion of values and, you know, from things like picking out a trait on a monthly basis, whether it be friendship, kindness, honesty, things like that. You know, values have an important role in every school community. Uh, they're part of RSE provision, of course they are, but they're they're right across the ethos of the school and everything that the school implements and right across the curriculum, right across the extracurricular activities, right across school assembly, right across everything that our school do, schools do is about establishing a strong value set for young people. Um, 
you know, so I, I think, you know, that isn't an area where I think we would say, you know, it's worrying or there's neglect of young people who are looked after children because our schools are fantastic at setting out clear values that are important within the school community and that apply to that school community. And of course, in good practice, the RSE provision is there within the school timetable to reinforce that. But, you know, on its own, that's not sufficient. It's the work that schools do to infuse good behaviour, um, you know, strong value systems right through everything uh, and a moral framework for how the school operates, you know. Okay. Yeah, that's that's very fact. reassuring to hear. And I am familiar with that in the local schools I visit regularly. Well, not so much over this last year, of course. But that's... Yeah. That, if that sense of values when you walk in the door hits you, and it's, it's an yeah. incredible power in that. So I do certainly concur with that, and that that's very reassuring. Sorry, I cut across you there. Yes, Sam. sorry, sorry, Justin. I'm sorry for cutting across you. Um, just to come back on your first point about the the thematic reviews being a, a number of years ago, and, and that, that is a fair point. But things haven't st stood still. Um, I mean, the development of resources has been ongoing consistently from 2018. So has engagement with schools. So. We are reacting to what's happening on the ground, and, and the resources reflect that. Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the good things I think, Justin, about our curriculum is that that idea of, you know, a statutory minimum, but then supplemented by what we call non-statutory curricular guidance. You know, you can get new guidance out and new resources out a lot quicker than you can change legislation. You know, so we we have that flexibility to update as new issues come out because. We all know that the Northern Ireland curriculum, uh, the legislation around it was introduced in 2007. And if we think about the developments in our society since the legislation was introduced, you know, around the LGBT communities, around um, child sexual exploitation and around the one that you're mentioning about the Internet and all of that, um, you know, huge changes in the last 15 years. But because we have that ability to supplement the strategy minimum. The strategy minimum hasn't gone out of date, but we're able to build on that through the non strategy guidance for schools that SEA produce and keep it contemporary. And as new issues inevitably come up in this decade, you know, we'll be able to keep doing that rather than saying, well, it's not set in the subject content that was outlined in 2007, so we're not teaching it. That's not the way our curriculum works. And that's effective, not just for RSE, but for many areas of the curriculum, you know, that as, as new information and new areas of importance uh, emerge, there's the flexibility there for schools. And I think it's important not to underestimate how powerful that flexibility can be, that there's time and space in our curriculum to explore issues as they come up. Yeah, okay, listen, I think it's uh, that's reassuring to hear, Suzanne, so thank you, and thank you all of you. And just finally, um, it is crucially important that the curriculum keeps abreast of social media and the advances in technology yeah. to protect children, to protect children yeah. from, from their, their, you know, not only those that, are, that potentially could be uh, impacting knowledge, but by doing so, they're impacting their own, themselves and their own yeah. futures potentially, and they could be branded and, and uh, typecast very early in life, and it could be destructive so the curriculum must keep abreast of technology and advances in technology and the technology companies must play a really crucially important role and must be held to account on that yeah thank you yeah thanks thanks justin can i bring in morris bradley mla please Yeah, that's me off now. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks very much to all for their appearance in front of the, of the committee this morning and also for their very clear uh, uh, responses and answers. I think members have covered uh, all the issues that I had concerns with. Uh, Nicola covered uh, teacher training, which I think is vital that ed educators are equipped to deal with RSD and, uh, as opposed to RSD being merely an add-on to a teacher's relevant qualifications. So I think that point was well made. The other issue I had concerns with has been raised by Robbie and Justin, Justin uh, and that is over the speed and spread of social media and different ways of social interactivity. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. I think there's now one out called Whisper and, 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 and you use something like, you know, there's a whole plethora of them, uh, plethora of them out there. Uh, and the peer pressure associated with social media regarding the looks and the expectations, et cetera, et cetera. And Justin did the point, well, 
that children can sometimes do things on social media which can haunt them for a long, long time. But my final comments, Chair, uh, would be the need to retain flexibility uh, around teaching RSC. I speak as a grandfather of 17-year-old twins, who will soon be 18, uh, and the realisation that both have matured at different levels, one being a boy and the other a girl. So I think flexibility is key in the educational relationships and sexual education. And I think that flexibility should be teacher-led. So I, I, for one, would be keen that the flexibility remains within the curriculum uh, as regarding RSE. Uh, so basically, Chair, that's really all the questions have been asked. Those are just a few comments. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Morris. Officials, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I mean, Chair, I think it comes back to the point that Suzanne made in response to Justin. Um, the the landscape has changed hugely since 2007, and the, and the flexibility in our curriculum has made, meant that we are able to respond quite quickly to that. So, um, But in terms of social media, for example, it, it's not just about making um, pupils aware of what social media can and can't do, but it's also the effects that that can have on their relationships and, the, and their self-esteem, which I think is very important. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, and that, that obviously links into uh, our, our next session in relation to addressing bullying in schools. Um, sound RSE is, is essential to uh, prevent bullying as well. Is that something that the department is considering? I think, I think Chair, the two go hand in hand. You know, good quality RSE provision helps to create uh, an inclusive environment. It helps to create an environment as I said earlier, where children feel that their views and opinions are valued, where they feel it's safe to be heard, where they feel they won't be bullied for expressing their view, their own personal views and opinions. So, you know, it can really assist. Obviously, there is a difference between what's taught in the curriculum and the policies and processes that schools have in place for dealing with a wide range of issues around safeguarding and bullying and incidents like that. But it is so important that you know the two can reinforce and support each other there's no two ways about it and i think you know there is so many opportunities through rse um to promote self-esteem and personal development but i think as well it's important to say rse on its own just doesn't do that good quality curricular provision um, enhances children's thinking skills their personal capabilities and um, making them confident learners can improve their self-esteem and helps them deal with the wide range of issues that uh, they confront in their wider life. So there's a role right across the curriculum in a whole in a whole range of, of subject areas and areas of learning that might not come to hand immediately. For example, the religious studies curriculum. Um, most children at key stage four study uh, ethics, and you know there's opportunities there to discuss issues. Um, such as an abortion, euthanasia, all of that, to talk about the moral implications, to give your personal views, to look at the different viewpoints of different groups. You know, so there's different areas of the curriculum can all add to the young person being a considered thinker and also in terms of not being afraid or re reticent to give their own personal views. So it's about creating a learning environment that's secure for the young person. And of course, that can impact on all those wider issues around safeguarding and bullying. Okay, thank you, officials. Um, very grateful for your, your briefing today. A uh, number of issues for the committee to take away and consider and perhaps return to you in due course. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any actions or requests for additional information resulting from our briefing. Clerk. Thank you, Chair. Um, the committee was concerned um, that the ETI thematic inspections hadn't taken place um, for quite some time, so uh, since 2013 and 2015 for primary school and post-primary school respectively. Um, so I think the committee will want to write to the department urging that that work is reprised as soon as the public health situation allows. Um, also, it would be uh, helpful that the department provide those reports to the committee um, alongside the minimum content order for RSE. 
Um, the question of monitoring of RSE policies uh, came up. Only one in four schools um, had one <clears throat> at the time of the last ETI inspections. Um, so the role of EA or DE in monitoring those um, and also the question of what guidance and support is given to Board of Governors in um, producing and developing their policy. Um, uh, that is a, is a good question for the department. Um, then um, I think it would be useful to have an update on uh, the work that's being undertaken by the education subgroup working on the Gillen recommendations um, to get some detail on the commissioning funding and time frame um, for production by CCEA of resources on consent. So those are new resources that have been um, um, pr proposed um, and whether they will be put on the RSE hub or how they'll be used. Um, also then um, to detail a wee bit of work on uh, the Stopping Domestic Violence and Abuse Strategy, uh, which is cross-departmental. Um, and again, there were uh, th there's some resource to underpin new materials in that area. So I think it'd be good to get some clarity on how those will be used. Um, the officials also mentioned um, resources around self-awareness, self-esteem, um, values and beliefs and some capacity building work on teacher professional learning and sexual health training um, that has been undertaken. Um, so I think a bit of more detail on that would be helpful. And I expect the committee agrees um, with officials that there's a need for profile raising and good practice sharing of RSE work generally. Do members have anything additional to that? Thanks, Clark. I think that's a robust summary. Um, as you said, members want to add or amend that? No? Okay, no. members Members content to agree those actions? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay. Members, I think at some stage that when we receive that information, the committee might want to consider whether we avail of the like of an education committee motion at the assembly in order to bring uh, some greater debate and scrutiny onto this matter. But I, I think we'll we'll take receipt of that information that we've requested and consider that in due course if members are content. Content. Okay. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, members. Clark, um, our next briefing is again from the Department of Education in relation to addressing bullying in schools. You had mentioned that the department might need some time to uh, to clean the, the room being used. Is, is that the case? Do we need to take a short break or have they had time to do that? Um, so they're still in the audience. Um, I'll just uh, get it. Let me see. No we, could, we could just bring them back. Us? Yeah, if I think. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. I think we're. I think we're okay. I, yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy to, to start us off on on this briefing. Then, yeah, uh, okay. no problem. There we okay. Go. Uh, agenda item six, then members, is the addressing bullying in schools, 2016 Act commencement order, Northern Ireland 2021 Department of Education briefing. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses and refer members to a briefing paper from Assembly Research in tabled papers, a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 18, a briefing paper from the Department of Education on the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act commencement order at page 20, and Department of Education correspondence at page 24. Can I welcome... Ricky Irwin, the Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing at the Department of Education. Julie Humphreys, Head of Additional Educational Needs Team at the Department of Education. Renee McDowell, Additional Educational Needs Team, Department of Education. Uh, I'm seeing a number of lists here, but three people in the audience. I'll keep going in case they are there. Gillian Cuthbert, Interim Head of Service of Post-Primary Behavioral Support and Provisions at the Education Authority. Shona Collinson, Interim Assistant at Director of Pupil Inclusion, Wellbeing and Protection at the Education Authority. You're all very welcome. Have I, have I covered everyone there? Yeah. Yeah, that's us all, Chair. That's great. Okay. Well, officials, the committee will be able to give you 10 minutes to make an opening statement, followed by 
questions from members if you want to make a start. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for inviting us today to provide an update to the committee on the introduction of the bullying in schools legislation. Bullying is a complex problem which changes and evolves over time, finding new means to manifest itself. This can be seen in the increasing use of technology such as mobile phones, computers, tablets and social media websites, adding to the complexity, subtlety and insidious nature of the problem. This does not mean that bullying should ever be considered an inevitable or acceptable part of school life for any pupil. It has a damaging effect on the well-being of our children and young people and we must do all we can to tackle it. In September 2013, at the request of the then Minister for Education, John O'Dowd, MLA, the Northern Ireland Anti-Bullying Forum undertook a review of current anti-bullying policies and practices within our schools. This review concluded that while all schools were aware of their responsibilities to tackle bullying, there was still a wide variation in the quality of schools' anti-bullying policies and procedures. It found that policies were not always applied consistently, that sometimes schools were too slow to react to bullying incidents, and that some schools' policies were rarely updated, allowing them to become dated and less effective. It also found that there were many examples of good practice across our schools. This was why legislation was seen as the best way to ensure all schools brought new, renewed focus and effort to this problem. As outlined in your briefing paper, a public consultation launched on the 5th of January 2015 and ran for an eight-week period until the 27th of February 2015. A total of just under 5,000 responses were formally submitted to the consultation when it concluded. The Addressing Bullying in Schools Bill was introduced to the Assembly on the 30th of November 2015, where it received cross-party support, and the Bill progressed through Assembly receiving Royal Assent on the 12th of May 2016, becoming the Addressing Bullying in Schools Act NI 2016. This legislation was introduced to provide a clear and consistent framework for all schools to follow and in doing so to ensure that all pupils are protected to the same high standards. By providing an inclusive definition of bullying, introducing a duty for schools to record all incidents of bullying and in strengthening the role of boards of governors in ensuring effective policies are followed, we believe it will achieve that objective. Schools have <coughs> excuse me, and will retain the freedom to develop flexible responses to disciplinary issues tailored to the needs of the school, its pupils and their wider community. Following a period of working with stakeholders to develop the necessary guidance and recording system, it was the intention to introduce the Act for the start of the 2019 academic year. However, the teaching unions raised some issues and the department agreed to a pause in the commencement of the legislation to allow for further engagement. Our intention to introduce the Act for 20, September 2020 was then impacted by COVID. We believed requiring schools to implement new legislation and put new processes in place at a time when there was ongoing disruption to learning and reduced resources was seen as adding unnecessary pressure to teacher workloads. We engaged further with the teaching unions more recently and have agreed to commence the legislation at the beginning of the 21-22 school year. And as such, we've introduced a commencement order bringing the Act into operation from the 1st of September. Training and guidance has been provided for schools and boards of governors. Schools now have some time to prepare ahead to update their anti-bullying policies to align with the requirements of the Act and to consult with parents, carers, pupils and staff if they've not already done so. It would be our intention to monitor implementation of the Act through ongoing engagement with stakeholders and by seeking feedback from schools. An education and training inspector will also have a role. So, Chair, happy to take any questions from yourself and members on this issue. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ricky. Can I, I start by asking the obvious question regards why it has taken uh, since 2015 to implement the Act? So 2015 was when the consultation um, was carried out, Chair, on the policy proposals for the legislation. Then there was the period of bringing the legislation through the Assembly. Uh, and as I said there, Royal Assent was obtained uh, in May 2016. The intention then after that was always uh, to work with schools and partner organisations to develop the necessary guidance and also to make sure that schools were trained uh, on this issue and boards of governors. 
There was also a requirement to bring forward uh, a standardised reporting system. So working groups were set up after the passing of the Act to work on those particular issues. The intention had been to commence the Act in September 19, but as I said, um, previously there were issues raised by um, the unions at that time, uh, and the unions had actually asked for implementation to be put on hold indefinitely. Um, the Department didn't agree to that, but we did agree to a temporary pause to allow for further meaningful dialogue with the unions on those particular issues. We then obviously had COVID in March of 2020, uh, and that put pay to our plans to implement it in September 20. But that was kept under review. The Minister was very keen uh, that at the first possible opportunity that the legislation be implemented. We continued to work with the unions on the issues that they had raised. Um, we resolved those issues, we updated the guidance. Uh, and just with the ongoing pandemic uh, and the situation in schools, um, it's been agreed that September 21 would be the ideal time to actually commence this legislation and give time to schools to prepare for that. Okay. And have pupils been at a disadvantage during the time of non-implementation? I wouldn't say they've been at a disadvantage, Chair. Um, this is not uh, a new issue. What the Act does is building... Uh, on the good practices that already exist within schools. Um, and it, it raises the standard in terms of trying to reach a level of consistency in how schools deal with this particular um, problem. So schools have always been dealing with the issue of bullying. Uh, and this is really about ensuring that level of consistency and providing that wee bit of additional support that's needed. Okay, and are you content that schools and unions do you feel adequately prepared and supported to implement the Act in the new school year? Well, there was a good period of um, co-design with school leaders and practitioners and others in terms of the resources that have been developed for this. Um, there was also co-design on the recording system. And then there was an extensive period of training for all schools and boards of governors. So all of that has been um, done. Pardon me. We are continuing to work with the EA, looking at what additional support may be needed uh, in advance of commencement of the Act and indeed as we go forward after September. So that, I think, will be an ongoing monitoring requirement for us. OK. And how, how exactly will a pupil benefit from the implementation of this Act and what additional protection from bullying will it provide? I think what the Act does is it, it raises the bar in terms of what schools are expected to do in law. So it places duties on boards of governors to ensure that they um, develop, implement, monitor and review their anti-bullying policies um, within their schools. The statutory guidance that goes along with um, the legislation provides additional advice to schools in terms of the types of uh, bullying incidents that need to be dealt with and what sort of um, support is available and how schools can deal with those. But I, I think an important thing is that this will mean that schools must monitor bullying incidents and they must look at the patterns and trends that are emerging and they have to put appropriate policies in place to deal with those. So ultimately, this will provide better outcomes for children who are experiencing bullying behaviour, but also children who are displaying bullying behaviour. Okay. Um, I, I would like to ask you about what you understand the extent of bullying in school that schools um, is, but I'm, I'm keen to bring in other members, and maybe you'll you'll refer to that in the, the course of our discussion. Can I can I bring in Pat Sheehan, MLA, Deputy Chair? Thank you, Chair, and that's exactly the question that I'm going to ask. Uh, you know, how many bullying incidents? are taking place in our schools each year. Ricky, do you have any uh, idea of that? Um, Pat, we don't gather stats on this. This was, this was actually an issue that was raised when the legislation was going through the Assembly in 2015-2016. There were concerns raised by members and schools that if the department was to gather statistics and publish statistics, this would result in you know league tables of, of schools in terms of um, bullying. So, at this time, there are no stats gathered in terms of individual incidents. However, at a school level, 
what the legislation will do will place a duty on schools to gather that information themselves and to make sure that their boards of governors have put in appropriate policies to deal with that. Now, for the department, it's important that once this legislation commences in September, that we have processes in place to look at the effectiveness of the legislation. So we will, I think, have to uh, commission uh, processes of evaluation. We'll have to try and maybe look at thematic pieces of research. Um, of course, our work won't stop come September when this commences. We need to look at how we are proactive in the area of bullying, what works, what doesn't work, and what can we strengthen, and how can we best support schools uh, in this issue. Yeah, and I mean, I, I understand the difficulties that you might face in terms of a, a league table, and hello, I don't see the need for any of that information to be published. Um, uh, you know, and the, the department should be aware of the level of bullying that's taking place and the number of incidents that are taking place in schools, I think. Uh, and, I mean, in, in terms of um, assessing uh, how the legislation is going to impact and if it's going to reduce the level of bullying, because, I mean... That's the reason it's even being discussed in the first place, because there is a problem with bullying and that needs to be eliminated if possible, or if not eliminated, then reduced as much as possible. Uh, and we need to have uh, some evidence to see that happening. And I, I'm just concerned in the light of recent reports about value for money uh, in terms of special educational needs and educational underachievement and so on, that there, there are clear processes in, uh, 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 operating in schools and in conjunction with uh, the EA and department so that we can see uh, what progress or lack of progress is being made. Would you, would you agree with that? I would agree that we absolutely need to be able to um, gather evidence and data in relation to the effectiveness of this legislation. Um, I think you know there will be rules for the department, there will be rules for the ETI in terms of inspection, making sure that the appropriate policies are in place, making sure that um, schools have consulted with pupils and parents in terms of how they've put those policies in place and how those policies deal with particular issues in those schools. I think as well there's probably a role for the Education Authority in terms of monitoring the level of support that they're asked for um, from schools. And maybe at this point, actually, I'll invite um, Shauna and Gillian from the EA just to give us uh, some insight and, and uh, some input in terms of their experience so far on that particular issue at an operational level. OK, thank you for that. I'll take that one. Um, so, of course, the, 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 whenever we look at bullying behaviour and what it is that we can do to support schools, it is necessary that we have a firm understanding of the prevalence, the nature and extent. Bullying is not just within the school environment. It is also on the journey to and from school. It is in communities. It is in the children's bedrooms whenever it comes to online bullying, etc. Um, so the data is important. Within the Education Authority, we do track the data of the calls that come to us from parents and schools in relation to that and the work with the uh, behaviour support team. And we do track that data. Um, over the last three years, we've had approximately 204 calls from parents and schools you know, looking for support. But obviously, with the implementation of the Act, it is going to be important that we monitor that. It is very much about bringing parents on board and their understanding of what, what this Act is and the impact that it will have um, on the ground and with young people. So it is vital that we continue to monitor the implementation of this Act to ensure that it, it does what it says and is effective on the ground with the support of young people with bullying. I think just to come in as well, I think it's important that, that through our referrals to our, our pupil-based um, support services, whether that's through our primary and post-primary behaviour support or our education welfare um, services, child protection services, that we monitor the, the, the nature of the calls and contacts um, and where there are themes of bullying um, and the motivation for the bullying, that we respond appropriately to that through the advice and guidance, but then as well through monitoring in terms of any training or wider support programmes that need to be um, put in place 
put in place based on the presented need um, within the incidents of bullying that, that may be reported uh, through referrals and, and, and health lines, etc. Okay, thank thank you for that. And and just uh, one one of the points was raised about bullying that may be happening, you know, as kids are going to or from school, and uh, you know, how feasible is it for schools to intervene in bullying that takes place outside of the school setting? Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'm happy to take that one. Well, when it comes to um, bullying that happens to and from school, you know, the journey is vital in the school day and it's really important, you know, part of a, a young person's journey. And if a young person is experiencing bullying to and from school and has an impact on their emotional health and well-being when they're in school, then we need to take action. Within the Act, it is asking schools to have preventative measures in place both to and from school. And schools are already working hard at this and doing this already. For example, with the local shop down the road is having teachers out on duty. But it's also creating that sort of ethos within the school that if a young person is experiencing bullying and also if a person is witnessing somebody experiencing bullying, that we empower our young people to seek help for those young people and report to their school. The actions that the school are to put in place in terms of punitive measures or anything along those lines is up to the individual school to take. But it's very much the Act is encouraging those preventative measures that the schools can put in place and within the policy being very clear as to when that will and will not happen. And again, we have the issue nowadays that young people come home from school or within their uniform for extended periods into the night. You know, so it's down to the schools to decide the parameters around when that action will be taken. But ultimately, it comes down to the welfare of the young person. If that has been impacted in any way, we have a duty of care to do something to support that young person. And are there any special measures or supports that the EEA would be willing to put in place if there was a particular problem outside of the school setting? Well, if, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, of course, it's looking at each individual case and looking to see what is the best appropriate action that can be taken. And again, putting in those um, supports that are needed. Obviously, when it comes to the community, part of it, if it is outside within the community and it is happening, it's about putting the strategies that we can control in place. So it may be looking at the pickup times and collection times of the young person. It could be that we have met, met bus monitors on board that you know, young people have a way to support. So it's really just looking at the individual circumstances and looking at what support is possible and feasible for that particular situation. And I think as well, just to come in with, with Gillian on that, as both as practitioners, you know, we're, we're both teachers by trade and, and senior leaders have been senior leaders in schools and educational settings. And it's about ensuring that, that, that schools and education settings involve their young people and, and their parents, carers and, and their community in the development of, of their policy and of their approaches. And, and that to support building that culture where young people can seek help and support in, in the way that they need. And then that is responded to based on the individual circumstances of, of that particular um, incident or, or situation that's been, hap been happening. But that inclusion through, through communication and working in partnership with, with parents, carers and young people is essential. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Pat. Can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Thank you, Chair. And can I thank the team uh, for, for joining us uh, uh, again this morning? I really only have one uh, question, Chair, uh, and that's around the area of the cyberbullying, which has already been touched on by the, uh, by the Deputy Chair. The, the, the indication is that the Act introduces a new power explicitly permitting boards of governors to include measures within the school's disciplinary policy to address cyberbullying. Maybe could you perhaps explain in a little bit more detail uh, what those new powers will be uh, and uh, and uh, what what well well just cover cover what the new powers would be in that cyberbullying area. Maybe if I start and then perhaps EA colleagues could come in behind me, Robin, if that's okay. Um, yep. Yes, so okay. okay. Um, Cyberbullying, I think, is a, is a particular um, complex problem that seems to have um, 
developed uh, in more recent years, obviously linked to the increased use of technology, social media, uh, and everything else. It's also a complex um, legal area, which probably goes beyond the competence of just the Department of Education in terms of, of how it's um, addressed. We also need to be mindful of um, parents' responsibilities in, in terms of um, the actions of children um, as well. What the Act does, I think, is it places a power within the hands of schools themselves to bring forward reasonable preventative measures um, to tackle cyberbullying, uh, if that is an issue in their school. It doesn't explicitly say what those measures um, should be. That, I think, will be something that we as a department will probably have to look at as we go forward and try to provide more advice to schools on. But I think in terms of tackling the issue of cyberbullying, and I mentioned it goes beyond me, um, what we've got at the minute um, is an online safety strategy, which has been published by the Department of Health, uh, and DE has been involved in the development of that. And that safety strategy, I think, um, is a powerful tool in terms of what are the actions that government in Northern Ireland needs to take to reduce um, incidents of cyberbullying, and how are we going to support children who have been um, uh, who have been experiencing cyberbullying? There's a three-year action plan that was published as part of uh, that strategy. The department has a number of actions in there. All of the actions will be led by the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. Uh, and funding for year one has been secured by the Department of Health, uh, and uh, Safeguarding Board will take those actions forward. When it comes into future years, DE will have a role in terms of working with schools uh, to identify online safety leads within each school who will be responsible for really putting the preventative measures in place at a school level um, and making sure that those are acted on and kept uh, updated as we um, go through delivery of that strategy. I think as well this is where we should mention the um, legislation that was announced yesterday by the UK government in terms of online harms uh, and the government's intention to bring forward an online harms bill. Um, again that demonstrates that this goes way beyond the competence of the Department of Education in um, Northern Ireland. Um, what that legislation will do, and we of course to support that, it will place a duty on external companies who uh, who have the social media sites, who have online forums, places a duty on them to take down any content which is harmful, child sexual exploitation, suicide material, um, online forums, and so on. Um, that's been led by DCMS in Westminster. Um, the link here. In the Northern Ireland Executive is the Department of Justice, and they will coordinate uh, the executive's response to that. So we have recently nominated um, a policy lead within the department, it's Angela Cain, who will be the DE link into that work. So in terms of addressing cyberbullying, there are lots of things at play here, which um, we all kind of need to make sure that they're taken forward and they, and they all work um, together. And hopefully that will have an impact on reducing cyberbullying. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it is an extremely complex area, and uh, it is obviously as you're saying, you know, it's a UK-wide uh, area, and UK-wide response probably is is required. I think you also mentioned that the department needs to recognise that this is a complex area, but that it will be for individual schools to decide what you say make of the new power. Does, is that not sort of a contradiction there? You know, it is extremely complex, but it'll be for the school to make uh, the use of what you say, make of the new powers. Yes, Rob, some of the resources that have been developed, uh, for example, the statutory guidance, which supports the legislation, and it includes a case study on um, bullying involving social media. So I think that's an example of how we can support schools in how they develop their policies to tackle cyberbullying. Um, but if we become aware, for example, of um, evidence of good practice that's out there, which is, is proving effective in this area, I think we have a responsibility to make, uh, along with our partners in the EA, to make sure that that's captured and disseminated across the, yeah, all of these yeah. schools. So I think that's something yeah. that we have.
Okay. So it, it just broke down there, Chair, in the last 30 no. seconds. No, no problem. You want to ask a further question there, Robin? Uh, no, if, if Ricky could just repeat what he was saying for maybe the last 15 or 20 seconds there or something. Okay. Ricky, thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, no, that's okay. Um, I, what I was saying was I think the department has a responsibility to capture good practice, which we know is proven effective in the area of cyberbullying out there. Uh, and we want to work with the EA in terms of identifying that good practice and making sure we disseminate that across um, all schools. Yeah. Okay. I'm content. Sure. Thanks, Robin. Uh, can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA, please? Thank you. Better turn the video on for you, Chair. You'll be you'll be cross with me. Um, thank you, guys. This is a it's a really uh, important piece of work. Um, um, and, uh, why is it important? It's important to me because I know exactly what it's like to be bullied in school. Um, uh, and people are bullied for many, many different reasons. Um, the reason that I was bullied in school is because I was a Christian and had a faith, and um, I can remember what it was like to be uh, physically abused, uh, verbally abused, uh, and to be spat on and that type of stuff. And that's that's a long time ago. I'm thinking that it was uh, 19, 1983 when I moved, went into post primary. Uh, it was a lonely place to be. So um, it's something that exists exist, has existed for a long time, and um, and it's something that perpetuates throughout life. Sadly, um, and I think we certainly need to be. Um, stepping up our game uh, to, to, to tackle this. That's a, it's, a, it's an incredibly insidious facet of life and the school should be that. And I know you, all, you guys agree from the department and, and through EA um, that we need to, to try and do what we can here. Uh, there, was, there was an indication earlier on about um, what uh, work could be done with the unions, perhaps with res uh, who had indicated reservations with regard to um, the legislation. Could you indicate what some of those issues perhaps that were raised by the union were? Um, yes, uh, Robbie, that's fine. Um, the concerns were raised in relation to the definition of um, bullying, um, the requirement for motivation to be recorded. Um, they also raised some issues around the boundaries uh, and whether the school day was being extended um, indefinitely. Issues of cyberbullying were actually um, raised as well and I think there was probably a general concern in relation to whether this would become onerous for schools in terms of record keeping um, as well. So um, what we what we had to do really was to work with them to work through those issues to try and address them in the guidance that was developed um, and we did that uh, and we updated the guidance and when we met with unions recently um, they were content with that guidance. Now, that doesn't mean that that guidance is is a final product that's never going to change again. Of course, if there are other concerns that are brought forward, um, we'll have to update the guidance and we'll have to address those concerns. But that certainly gives you a flavour of some of the concerns that were raised. And that was at a time, Robbie, whenever there was action short of strike as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we didn't have uh, a minister or an executive or an assembly at that period as well. So the decision... The request was to pause, or sorry, was to um, stop implementation indefinitely. But the um, decision by the department, taken at a senior level, was to pause implementation while we engaged with unions on those issues. Okay, um, you, you sort of answered my second question, which was with regard to you, you believe the unions were basically um, on board um, and committed to the implementation. Um, are there any reservations, do you think, um, uh, with regard to, are there any extant issues or things that have been omitted or things that could perhaps are still in negotiation? I, I wouldn't say there are still things in negotiation. I, I would say there probably are still some residual concerns that, that unions might have, but perhaps until we get into the period of implementation after September, um, you know, we, we won't know if they will materialise um, or not. You know, the issue around record keeping is probably a, a legitimate one because, of course, the duty places or the, the act places a duty on schools to make sure every incident is recorded and the motivation is recorded. But I think what we've tried to do with the guidance and with the SIMS recording system on C2K is to, to try and provide as much support to schools and structure in terms of how they actually 
um, capture that information. And ultimately, of course, the objective is that that will help the school in terms of monitoring the patterns of behaviour within school and then putting in the appropriate policies to tackle that. So anything that we've done through the legislation and, and through the supporting guidance and so on is really to help schools. Okay, brilliant. Um, I asked this question in and around um, what the effective outcomes for um, a revised RSE curriculum would be. So I'm going to ask the same with regard to um, monitoring the effectiveness of legislation and what success uh, would look like. Is there a baseline and is, and is there um, a, a target um, that you could share with us? There wouldn't necessarily be a target. Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think we would share the vision that the committee have that we eradicate bullying. Um, but what I would say is, I don't think this legislation is a silver bullet for that. Yeah. But I do think that this raises the bar in terms of the quality and standard of our response to tackle that. So come September, our work doesn't stop. Um, we need to make sure we have robust monitoring processes in place to measure the effectiveness of the legislation and what's happening in schools on the ground. I think we need to commission further research in that area. I've mentioned capturing and disseminating good practice. So. Um, this is just the beginning in terms of, of what we're doing here. I think we have much more um, work to do in that area. And of course, uh, we would want to get to the point where you know, bullying is, is basically eradicated um, right across our schools. But as has been mentioned uh, previously by members, it's not just a school problem. It's not just a childhood problem. It's a pervasive societal problem which requires collaborative approaches right across society and go, goes way beyond um, departments and, and DE, but we certainly um, have a role to play in terms of tack, trying to tackle bullying within the school environment, and, and I hope that members can see that the, the Act will, will certainly strengthen um, the approaches that schools uh, are armed with. Okay, and my final one, and thanks for that, um, I think it's really important to go back to my first point, that you know, um, the people are bullied regardless of their difference and, and basically if you're slightly different whether that's LGBT whether it's because you have a faith whether it's a body issue um, we need to make sure we don't neglect anybody with regard to, to why they're bullied um, here's a slightly more it's not controversial but I just want to spread this a wee bit further if it's okay so um, whilst the, the, the basic tenet of this is to protect children uh, and that is rightly so bullying doesn't just happen to children so we have incidents for instance where either um, and I have to declare an interest as a, a board of governor um, too, although this doesn't relate to my school, that sometimes teachers are, are receive bullying as well, you know, are perceived to be on the receiving end of bullying, um, and intimidation, certainly on social media, perhaps, um, uh, in some instances from some parents. And also there are incidents where teachers may be accused of bullying. So is there anything that's picked up in either in this or another piece of legislation which seeks to um, protect teachers from 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 um, elements of bullying, but also if if teachers uh, are being accused of bullying, that that is also picked up. Really, you want to? Really, you want um, to? Yeah, Robbie, the act is uh, specific to bullying with children and school young people. Um, it doesn't stretch beyond that. Um, anything where you would have a teacher bullying a child, or child bullying a teacher, it would come on. Yeah. It would come under the disciplinary policy okay. or the conditions of employment, so it would be totally outside this act. I, I'm, I'm unaware of if there is legislation for. Oh. Oh, okay, and, and one of the things, and, and uh, no, this isn't uh, directed at you guys, I mean, bullying behaviour um, possibly can be mapped through. through you know, through someone's life. So I'm just thinking in terms of that holistic look at if we're going to look at this, um, you know, right through and, and, and across every industry, there are incidents of it. It's not in teaching, it's in life. And I'm interested to know that people who bully when they're younger, they, you know, are they likely to bully when they're older? And what do we do? So this is like almost a restorative justice piece as well. So whilst it is right to protect those that are bullied, those that are doing the bullying sometimes um, from, a, pr from a perspective of, of their background sometimes, um, it's not just that, so maybe that, that punishment that everybody would reach into. Sometimes, you know, do we do enough to find out behind the scenes why someone is bullying and how we, what we do to, to, to prevent, you know, to, to move them on as well. Not move them on, that's the wrong term of words, but to help them to, to re bring them out of that so that it's not something that's repeated in school, but also it's not behaviour that becomes part of their, their being. That's my last well, point. There should be support measures in place. You know, it's not just a case of the bullying's identified, we record it, 
and we know what's happening. But there should also be support right across, you know, um, should it be counselling for the person who's being bullied, for the person who's ex uh, showing the bullying behaviour. If it's not a case of just writing everybody off, there should be a holistic approach where we need to sit down, need to find out why it's happening. Is there maybe something more important happening at home that's causing them to be a bully? You know, um, and within um, the guidance, the support and guidance with um, there's a restorative justice part in it where, you know, you can sit down, talk across it, find out what's happening. It could be a simple case of the, the person who is showing bullying behaviour needs extra support for something. They're not necessarily a nasty person. They're not just picking on somebody for the sake of doing it. There's something there where they need the support. So we can't just rule everybody out. Oh, they're a bully. You know, there, there, there has to be more, more to it because nobody just chooses to be like that. Yeah, Robbie, you know? just to find coming on the back of that, I think, you know, behaviour is a form of communication and we've talked about that in the, in the context of additional needs and special educational needs. Um, so it's important to try and get an understanding of why the behaviour is happening. Is there an unassessed need, as Rini has said? Um, are there other circumstances happening in a domestic setting? And it's important too for pupils who are displaying bullying behaviour that they understand the impact that that has on the pupils who are experiencing that behaviour and try to work through those issues. So those restorative practices are very important uh, in all of this. And I think it comes back to trying to identify what works and what doesn't work and making sure we've captured all of that and we've, we've put that out uh, across the schools. Okay, that, that's a really important piece. So, yeah. Well, was chair, chair, is it possible that the, the Education Authority can come in? Of course, yes, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Just, just uh, really to say around um, that, you know, the, the, the priority really is to ensure that educational settings are safe places for the young people and the staff that work within the educational set settings and that young people and staff can both have confidence through policies, whether that is through the anti-bullying policy for young people or whether it's through um, policies for staff and HTR policies, that, that staff and young people can have confidence, that they can seek help, that they can make reports and that they, they know that action will be taken um, to support them in, in whatever the circumstances may be. Uh, and I think that's important, uh, you know, that we bear that in mind that it is about educational settings being safe places for staff and young people to be happy in order to be able to engage with their learning or engage with their work um, and delivery of their teaching. And can I just also add just a very, very important point there in that if we don't have the early intervention and prevention that's required, then this behaviour does continue on into adult life. And unfortunately, a lot of the young people who do display bullying behaviour, yes, once it's pointed out to them, it can be nipped in the bud quite quickly. So that's early intervention, relationship development, and supporting our young people with those pro social skills and realising I'm calling it out when something is right or wrong. But also look at the other extreme, that we have a significant number of young people who have experienced extreme trauma in their life. We've been out of control and therefore find that control by exhibiting those behaviours in others. And they need support, not just within you know, the school, within the school environment, but also within services. And this needs to be marked through the code of practice because support intervention from psychology, from outside agencies is essential if we're going to turn the curve at that stage rather than trying to fix something later on in life. Great. Thank you. That's, that's, that's excellent. Thank you, Fatten. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Can I bring in William Humphrey, MLA, please? Thank you very much, all of you, for your attendance and your, and your input. Um, I think bullying is a horrible thing, and bullies are despicable people. It doesn't matter whether they're at school or in, in, in adult life. Anyone who's subject to bullying uh, and who's suffered from bullying, you know, that has a hugely negative and can be a long-lasting effect. And we need to do what we can in society, not just in the, in the classroom and schools, but in society to remove bullying. It is a, a scourge. And so whenever you have um, pupils and, and, and their parents coming through the door of our offices uh, around this issue and the, how that traumatizes the child, but also has a knock-on effect on, on their parents who feel completely powerless when, they're, when their child's being bullied at school. And the child's fearful of going to school and the parents don't want to send the, school, the child to school because, frankly, some schools are lamentable in how they deal with it. That's something that needs to be sorted out. And so I was really interested 
Ricky, when you were talking about raising the standard and getting a consistent approach, that is absolutely crucial, folks, because some schools deal with this very, very effectively. Other schools don't, in some cases, I have seen either don't take it seriously or just don't deal with it at all. So we need, and that's all down, down to leadership, but it's also down, I would think, to interpretation of rules and regulations. And so therefore we need to get consistency and we need to see them being applied consistently and firmly. So how do we do that? Yes, um, William, I think, I think that's an important point. Um, I mentioned before about the importance of our evaluation of, of implementation uh, of the Act. I think, I think there's, there's a role for the department, there's a role for the EA, and I mentioned there's a role for, for the ETI. Um, you know, we need to be looking at the quality of the policies that are put in place uh, by individual schools. We should also be looking at whether there's been consultation by the schools with pupils and parents to develop um, those policies. Um, and we want to see evidence that boards of governors are actually considering this issue uh, on a regular basis, that they're actually looking at the numbers within their schools and that they're taking um, appropriate action. I think as well we probably need to commission um, qualitative research in terms of um, the impact that bullying has. Um, there have been pieces of research in the past. I think we'll have to commission research as we go forward once this is implemented to see whether um, there are particular issues emerging. Where's the good practice? Can we disseminate that? And so on. So um, it, it is important that we don't just sit back, that we're proactive, that we try and gather the evidence of the impact of all of this and that we respond appropriately going forward. I think, I think getting a clear policy and a, uh, that is being applied consistently across schools is hugely important uh, because we have to put ourselves in the, in the shoes of, um, I mean, I don't have children, but I have, have a young niece, great niece, who last year at six years of age was absolutely traumatized uh, about going into school and her mother was beside herself and her father so frustrated because, you know, they, they both felt powerless. And I saw that at close hand, what, what my own family was going through. And I've had people coming through the door of this office in exactly the same position. So it's incumbent upon all of, upon all of us to get a policy, to see that that policy is being adhered to, and that the leadership in, in, in um, schools and governors, and I say it as, as a governor in both a primary and secondary setting, are actually ensuring that those policies are being applied. Um, and, and consistently and an approach, consistent approach taken. But the other thing I would say is it is incumbent upon the department and, and the EA to police it because there's no use writing a policy and having the policy in place and it not being policed because that's failing the young people uh, in, in our classrooms. So I'd be interested in what the EA have to say about it as well, Chair. Okay. I'm happy to take this one. Um, no, is that okay? Okay, so yeah, just, sorry, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so just in relation to what you were raising about the consistency, the good thing about this Act is that we will have a common definition. Prior to the Act coming into implementation, schools could have a multitude of definitions. So the most important point is that we all have a clear understanding of what bullying behaviour is and the difference between that and unacceptable or antisocial behaviour. Um, when it comes to dealing with bullying, it is very complex for schools because, as you're aware, uh, schools can only deal with the facts that they have in front of them, but it's looking at clarifying those facts and the perceptions of others and about putting that support in. Communication is vital when anybody in situation and keeping those lines of communication open. And again, part of that being with the preventative and the, the, the sort of the how a, a school deal with bullying is it's very important to establish that communication. When it comes to the policing of this, ultimately it will come down to the governors in the school in order to make sure that they are effectively monitoring that with a, a review of the anti-bullying policy. And that needs to be ongoing um, so that a school, a board of governors is aware of the, the, the number of bullying in, um, instances and the alleged bullying instances. And is there a policy fit for purpose prior to this date? Governors, as you know, will only be made aware of a bullying situation if it reaches the complaints policy. So by this, we know it will give governors a view as to, you know, at their meetings, how many instances of bullying or alleged bullying has happened. So they can have that effective monitoring of the policy that's in place and make the necessary changes as the school moves forward. 
Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the thing is, China, China's, say China's bullied the day after a governor's meeting. The governor won't meet for another month. And it, this is only escalated to the governors. Uh, and that month, essentially, the people who have to deal with it, a leadership team in the school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my concern is, you know, there needs to be consistency, there needs to be clear policy, and it needs to be policed. And I don't think up to now it has been, and I welcome this approach. I'm not being critical. I do welcome this approach because this is a, this is an appalling thing, uh, bullying. But can I ask then, alongside that, what new training will then be available to make sure this consistent approach of this new policy is actually being applied? So ultimately, obviously, in the implementation of the Act, the schools receive training in relation to bullying, uh, the, or the, the Act itself. But prior to this, the schools have been working under the Effective Responses to Bullying Behaviour Framework, which is where the, the priority needs to be now, with supporting schools with actively um, dealing with bullying situations and putting the appropriate supports in. So the Effective Responses to Bullying Behaviour is a levelled approach, obviously working from whenever there's the low intervention, whenever something is arising, a difficulty in a friendship, because that is the time whenever the, most, the supports and interventions are most effective. So it's making sure... That those are addressed. So there will be further training support provided to schools in the updated version of the effective responses to bullying behaviour in light of the Act as we move forward. Mm-hmm. Well, look, thank, thanks very much, everybody. This is a huge and important issue. And, Chair, can I just make a suggestion that perhaps we as a committee uh, look at this in terms of over a given period just to, just to ensure in terms of the policing that it is being policed and that the supports are being put in place both for teachers uh, and, and particularly the leadership team and governors. Uh, and it would be good as well, Ricky, as you've said, in terms of, I would like to be interested in a follow up on this, of some research being done in terms of getting a corpus of information, how it actually is being applied. Mm. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Yep, thank, thanks for that suggestion, William. It definitely a standing priority for the Education Committee to take forward, agreed. Okay, can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA, please? Thank you, Chair, and thanks to everyone for your evidence here um, this morning. Um, this is really positive news. Um, I definitely welcome the legislation. I think most people will and should. Um, as has been outlined this morning already, you know, things have changed so much in the world in the last number of years from when I was at school and um, like the cyberbullying we talked about social media and all that there so it really is time for um all this, the, the legislation to be updated so i'm pleased about that much of what um i wanted to discuss has been discussed but one thing i want to pick up on was about help for parents and families for both um children who have been bullied and for children who have bullied um First of all, what engagement have you had with families around this issue? And then is there anything within this legislation to help parents um, on either side of it? Um, Gillian, maybe I could invite you to comment from an EA perspective initially, or Shauna, if that's okay. In, in relation to parents, then, um, obviously it is essential that parents have the full understanding of what this Act means. And again, I go back to what I said previously, is that they understand as well what the definition of bullying actually is and how that differs from unacceptable behaviour. Um, but either way, if a child's experiencing either, the important thing is that something needs to be done to support or change that. In relation to the Act, um, we have again created um, leaflets and information um, we've got a video as well underway at the moment to be able to explain the act to 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 parents and it's also been converted into 11 different languages so that we're trying to get that spread out there um, in addition as well through the northern ireland anti-bullying forum we have created the parent toolkit which is again a guide of advice and information um, again looking at how you can support your young person how we can communicate with the school, and again, then the complaints procedure within that. But it does give practical tools to do at home, because I know with some parents, the work that we've done, especially through the Northern Ireland Anti-Bullying Forum, and myself, and myself speaking with parent groups, parent network groups, doing webinars, etc., that it is that powerlessness, and it's how do we support parents to be proactive, to engage with the school, and to support both parties to come to a resolution, because it is important that we work together. A lot of times, 
It is thought that a punitive response is what's needed to sort a situation, whereas we're all aware that punitive measures do not change behaviour. It is about supporting the young people with a change in behaviour. First of all, understanding how their behaviour has impacted others so they can make the change, and then putting in those supports, wellbeing support, self-esteem, peer mentoring groups, all of those preventative and supportive measures that, are, that schools can aid in order to support young people and parents to find a resolution. Mm -hmm. and maybe if I could just add to that and what Julian has said, Nicola, in terms of some of the other support mechanisms that the department has put in place. Obviously, there's a health and wellbeing um, framework for education settings, which has a range of projects, some of which have started, some of which will start um, later next year. Um, there's the counselling um, service as well. There's the work of the Anti-Bullying Forum and the resources that the department provides to support that. And there's also uh, a safeguarding app, um, which was launched during COVID, which we're now working with um, the company on to expand the functionality of. Uh, and that will include resources that parents, as well as pupils in schools, have access to in relation to not just safeguarding, but also bullying and dealing with bullying. So there's a range of measures there in place. Thanks for that, Ricky. Um, no, that's that's good. I'm glad to hear that because I do think it's so important that everyone works together and comes together. And I think it's it's a really difficult time for parents on either side of it um, to try and cope with either their child that's being bullied and, um, or a child that is bullying. So it's, it's really important that the support network is there for them as well. Um, Listen, uh, most of what I wanted to ask has been touched upon. The other, the main thing was about training for um, school staff and that, which you have touched upon. So thanks for the update. I really appreciate that. Um, as I say, really um, important legislation and what I fully support it. So thanks very much to everyone. And thank you, Chair. Thanks, thanks, Nicola. Ricky, that's the Safer Schools app, isn't it? Yeah. That's right, Chris, yeah. Yeah, that seems to be an excellent app and one for us to continue to promote. Thanks. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys, for your very, very important evidence today. Um, can I ask very bluntly, how many suicides among school children have been attributable to bullying over the last year? How, what figures do you have over the last year, over the last five years in terms of that? impact and that's that horrific impact of bullying. I'm familiar of cases locally here which have been devastating for the family and the community. Justin, I wouldn't have that data uh, with me. I'd, I'd need to come back to you on that, if that's okay. Okay, I appreciate that, Ricky. Um, can you tell me, um, what to explain the discrepancy between the, the TIMS data and the EADE uh, data in terms of the, the percentage of kids who've experienced bullying, where TIMS is around um, 28%, I believe, and EA is 42%. Why is there that such a discrepancy? We know this. Um, I, unfortunately, I, I don't know the answer to that one either, um, Justin, unless colleagues in the EA have any more information on that particular issue. No, I'm, I'm just wondering what, what data is, is being referred to, um, but I'm not, I'm not aware. Right. Apologies. Well, but we can come back if there's... Yeah. We'll follow if up on that. particular piece of data, we can we can um, absolutely come back to you on a response with that data, clarify what the data refers to. Right. Well, it's worrying then that the international norm seems to be a lot lower than the norm here, which is, is of huge concern. And um, I'd like to see why why there is that discrepancy. Um, um, so, it'd be grateful if you could come back to me on that. In terms of the types of bullying, which which type of bullying is most prevalent now? Do you feel in schools? Physical bullying, psychological bullying, sexual bullying, or cyber bullying? Or do, what, what data do you have to support your, your understanding of this? I'll maybe invite EA colleagues just to see if they can give us some insight on that based on their engagement with schools, please. Yeah, okay, so the only official data that we have is from the 2011 Nature and Extent of Bullying Behaviour in Northern Ireland. And at that point in time, it was still very much the physical and the verbal. Um, but again, and again, we sort of come across that we think cyberbullying is greater. Um, but obviously, it's still a behaviour of name calling and exclusion of being left out is still one of the was the biggest challenges that we have, and we've seen that being extended now right the way across into 
the cyber world in the sense of young people being excluded from WhatsApp groups. It's no longer now just birthday parties, etc., that we would have heard of, but it's now very much now on the online. So it just highlights the need again further that we do need to have that um, information on the prevalence and the nature and extent of bullying behaviour within Northern Ireland so we can target those resources. Yeah, listen, I, I get from all of you your passion to address this issue and I don't I don't envy your task because you know you've you've stated that educational places about the importance of making educational places safer places for staff and pupils and where they feel safe and secure and that's that's uh, obviously essential. Um, but but how you're able to manage this given the prevalence of cyber communication now, it's it's a totally it's a total minefield and how how you can navigate this territory to protect all the kids. It's going to be such a, such a major, major task. And I wish you well in your, your, your objectives and your aims and to protect children and, and, and staff and parents. But on that, you, know, you talked about the online harms bill, right, which has to go through Westminster, obviously. How much impact, how, 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 how much control can be exerted? And where does that, where does that control need to be exerted? To ensure safety for children and young people online, and that is that, that's well and good for a bill you pass through Westminster, then be carried forward through by the Justice Minister here. The social media companies need to take responsibility, and to what extent do you believe that has to happen? Well, Justin, as I mentioned, I would fully support the DCMS bill in this area because um, it is designed to, to tackle those companies that have the online forums in place on on the social media. Sites and we know we we very clearly know the impact that harmful content content has on on everyone, but on children and young people, um, especially. So, um, you know, we will work very closely with our executive colleagues uh, through the Department of Justice to um, support, provide whatever support um, and advice needs to be provided um, to make sure that that you know that bill goes through. Um, I think it's the importance of the online safety strategy as well, which I talked about previously, which the Department of Health has published there back in February of this year. It's also the importance, I think, of, and you'll be pleased to hear me say the word culture, in terms of how do we support schools to embed that um, culture within their schools to eradicate um, bullying, and what can we do uh, to support them? And we know what we know is the evidence of uh, is there to show that collaborative approaches work best. So parents, pupils, teachers, boards of governors, all working together within the school environment to make sure that there's been consultation on the policies, that the policies are strong, that there's a strong curricular approach. And you heard um, colleagues before us talking about the preventative aspect and the curriculum aspect, and we would fully support them. And I heard Suzanne <coughs> talking about how those aspects need to work hand in hand. So I think that's important. It's the importance of training and development. It's the importance of the prevention strategies and also the strategies in reporting and responding to bullying. So there's a whole um, series of things which need to work together to actually embed that culture within schools. So you know that would be our objective uh, as part of this work. Excellent, Ricky. That, that's music to my ears. It's, it's a culture piece, and it's not just an education; it's a societal piece. You know, it has to happen in every every area of society. That there's a zero tolerance approach adopted to to bullying. Um, another interesting statistic which I'd like to just probe: cyberbullying is much more likely to impact girls. Right, have you data to support that? Um, uh, from recollection, Justin, there was work done by um, NCB, National Children's Bureau, recently, which helped inform our uh, our well-being, our health and well-being framework for schools. Um, and I, I would need to refer back to it, uh, so I don't want to be 100% on this, but I think that supports what you've just um, said there in terms of cyberbullying. It certainly indicated that cyberbullying was a growing problem um, for uh, teenagers uh, within schools. Um, uh, and you know aspects of self-esteem. Um, this is where cyberbullying can have a particularly negative uh, impact for for all children, young people, not just um, girls. So, I mean, the evidence the evidence is there. Um, we just need to make sure that we have the appropriate strategies and strategies in place to to respond to it. Um, that, that has to be addressed uh, post haste. Um, also, Ricky, you, you said behaviour is a form of communication. I believe I don't believe bullies are inherently bad. Right? They're, they're dealing with issues in their own lives, which is reflecting how they behave themselves. 
And on that point, there were the um, records are kept within schools on every bullying, bullying issue, which mm-hmm. is uh, now essentially legislatively. How long are those records now kept? Oh, uh, I think there, there, uh, there's guidance on that. Um, we have child protection um, circulars and advice currently out there with schools, which gives advice on how long records should be kept. The answer is I don't know how long, but again, I'm happy to come back with an answer to you on that particular question, um, Justin. Okay, listen, thank you very much for your evidence, folks, and the best wishes on your endeavours, and it's all to your average responsible for uh, tackling bullying, so wish you well. Thank you very much. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Justin. Morris Bradley, MLA, thanks. Morris, Morris there. It's on the screen, but I'm not sure his audio is working there, so... He's muted, maybe? He's muted. Morris, do you need to unmute your audio? Okay. Uh, if if Morris uh, hears me or the audio returns, feel free to interrupt me and we'll try and get you in for a final question, Morris. Otherwise, officials, can I thank you for your oral briefing today on what, as you can see from the discussion, is an extremely important matter and a, a priority for the Education Committee. Uh, we, we look forward to staying in contact with you on this important matter uh, and wish you well with the, the, the long-anticipated implementation of the Act. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and to add members back into the spotlight and ask the clerk to summarise any actions from the briefing? Okay, Chair, thank you. Um, So uh, in terms of cyberbullying, that came up at the beginning and towards the end again. I mean, um, it it is a big problem and it is kind of beyond what seem to be our legislative competence. So the UK online harm um, work is addressing it to some extent, and it just is a reality that schools are having to deal with as well, which is very difficult. Um, one of the main things that came up then about um, the department's position as it goes into this, the commencement of this legislation is um, a lack of, of baseline data. Um, now the committee had before it, and Justin referred to some of this, um, statistics that said that nine to 13 year olds said bullying was the biggest issue they responded to. Um, The 2017 Life and Time survey said that 42% of respondents, 45% of whom were female and uh, of females and 37% of males had been bullied at some time in the past. And also the Equality Commission reporting that bullying had an overweening impact on um, LGBTQI pupils. So the committee might want to share um, its research with the department. Um, The department is going out now to commission um, research, even though commencement is is really approaching very soon. Um, So the next thing really to think about is... um, you know, raising standards, um, as William said, for a collective approach to bullying across schools that's going to be applied consistently and firmly. Um, The legislation um, does provide that the department may publish guidance on reporting of bullying. Um, So I think that the committee will want to know um, what plan DE has to publish guidance um, that will describe a robust monitoring process uh, and support implementation. Um, the, then that will create a structure, I suppose, for post-legislative scrutiny as well, so that uh, the Assembly can look into implementation um, in terms of uh, how many schools have got uh, policies, how many um, Board of Governors have been trained, for instance, um, uh, how many policies include all of the categories referenced in the legislation and perhaps additional categories of pupils. Um, then uh, the EA 
um, uh, talked about um, education settings being safe places for young people and staff, um, early intervention required so that bullying behaviour doesn't continue into adulthood and restorative practices um, uh, because anybody, I guess, can be a bully um, depending on what's going on in their life. So I think there's just a desire to detail the respective roles that will be played by the Education Authority, uh, the Department and Boards of Governors in implementation. Um, the committee welcomed um, the resourcing that's underpinning um, uh, commencement of this legislation, and um, particularly the safeguarding app. Um, and there was one specific question then from, um, gosh, I think it was Justin maybe, um, for figures um, for suicides attributable to bullying. So if the department has that information, um, that would create a very clear picture for us. Members, was there anything else that you wanted to add? Members content to agree those actions? Robbie? Content. That's a thumbs up. Okay, thanks. That's Perfect. great. Content. Okay, yeah. Just, yeah. Justin wants to come in. Justin, yep. Yeah, just so we can get that information that you request, the profile, the types of bullying that are prevalent in schools, that suicide data, and um, also the um, justification for the discrepancy between the TIMS and the EEA and DE data. Um, and what was the final one? Yeah, for how long is the data stored by uh, the Education Authority in terms of bullying incidents in schools? Okay. okay. Justin, when you say types of bullying, do you mean um, the intent behind the bullying? No, we see there, there's, there's four types of bullying, physical bullying, uh, psychological bullying, sexual bullying, or cyber bullying, which, which what's the, the predominance? The, the, the breakdown, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, members agreed. Okay, thanks for that, members. Then I'll move to agenda item seven, correspondence. Can I refer members to page 28, where we have eight items of correspondence and a summary note at page 29. Ask the clerk to speak to the correspondence. Yes. Um, slight freeze there on my screen, I beg your pardon. No problem. Uh, okay. Um, members, item 7-2 on page 31 is a response from the Minister regarding mandatory autism training for teachers. The Minister states that the implementation of mandatory training would not be in line with DE's teacher professional learning strategy and any requirement for training to be mandatory would be um, repercussive for other areas of special educational needs. Um, so just seeking your views on that response. Yeah, I, I think this is a fairly significant response and use of language members. Um, I, it's not... It's not a, a use of language that I've seen from the minister before in relation to mandatory autism training for teachers, not least given an assembly motion was passed, if I recall correctly, without dissent um, in relation to mandatory training for teachers. So we will want to send that response to Autism NI and to the all party group on autism, of which I declare an interest as a member if necessary. Um, for for their consideration and and response to us for any further action from us, members want to add to that or content with that action. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Chair. That uh, we forward that correspondence to those sectors you've just mentioned uh, and await their view before we go back to the department on it. But it's certainly a significant uh, communication from the department. Thanks. Mm. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, sure. Okay. Can I just say something? Yeah. Robbie, yeah, Robbie, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. I, I had been out to Middleton a, a while ago on this and was as part of the APG, so I think it's a, it's a significant development. But what it would do, and I think Pat's right, and, and you're right, Chair, but we need to caution just obviously the knee jerk is to nearly take it as a as a dismissive statement. However, what would need to be bottomed out is what. Um, not so much initial training, but ongoing training looks like. Because if you look at the letter, they talk about the teacher led in terms of that ongoing training and refresher, if you like. So I think what, what I would like to know is what what ongoing training is possibly required if 
you know, if, if they do have a, a reasonable position, it doesn't seem like a reasonable position. However, I think it's worthwhile trying to develop this further to see what ongoing training uh, would, would look like and how that would impact on teachers. But it's hard to see yeah. the rationale at this stage. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, so we'll, we'll send that to the interested parties, seek their response, and then consider further action if necessary. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you, Clark. Okay, item 73 on page 35 is a response from the Minister for the Economy regarding the measures and, and assistance the Department for the Economy provides to help young people and adults with autism to enter and remain in employment. Um, so, members, again, you might want to forward this response to Autism NI. Agreed. 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 Thank you. Okay. Um, item 75 on page 42 is correspondence from the Committee for the Executive Office regarding um, Statutory Rule 2021 uh, stroke 114, uh, which is the Department's Transfer of Functions Order Northern Ireland 2021. Um, so I've sought advice from the examiner of statutory rules um, on that and we will hear back in due course. Um, that being the case, are you content to note this for now? Agreed. Agreed. Thanks, Clark. Thank you, um, Chair. Item 76 on page 52 is correspondence from the Construction Employers Federation providing their response to the Strategic Investment Board's call for evidence on a new investment strategy um, for Northern Ireland. Um, members, have you views on what, what you'd like to do with this information? Um, I, perhaps members want to consider an informal meeting with the Construction Employers Federation at a mutually convenient time uh, in, the, in the future. Just to maybe go into some of those issues in a bit more detail, would members be open to that? Yeah. Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Agreed. Thanks, Thank Clark. You. Thank you. Um, Okay, item 77 on page 60 is correspondence um, from an, indiv an individual regarding SEN numeracy support and school transition. Um, so members, the policy issue then would be um, whether there is a change to numeracy support um, or a lack of it, um, and also the aspect of, of changing schools. Um, so. I suggest that um, that the committee write to the department asking about support available. Yeah, I, th I think that's a that's a, a fair proposal, Clark. If we could forward that correspondence and ask the department to respond to the the policy aspects of it, um, as obviously we wouldn't um, be dealing with individual cases, but that, I, I think that would be helpful. Members content to agree that action? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we could also forward the response from DE about transition um, from St Mary's Brawler that we've already received. We could also send that to the correspondent if members are content. Agreed. Great. Yeah. Okay. Item 7, 8 on page 62 um, and tabled today uh, is correspondence from an individual again re regarding the introduction of legislation in relation to school uniforms. Um, school uniforms have come up um, a few times now in in uh, correspondence and members might want to, to arrange an informal meeting um, on this and commission some research on approaches to uniform um, in different jurisdictions. Yeah, Clark, I, I thought it might be worthwhile us taking a, a, a briefing from Assembly Research with regards to how other jurisdictions are, are reforming their statutory guidance in relation to school uniforms. With, Members be content with that? Content, yeah. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay, so research with a view to then perhaps um, an informal meeting. Okay, thank you. Um, so then, members, just to um, complete the circle, in table papers are several notifications um, just to bring to your attention. So one is from CCAMS of a study into its nursery school provision. One is a notification from CCEA that it's running a 10 day consultation with stakeholders on its proposed post results service. Um, one is a research paper from the finance committee outlining scrutiny arrangements um, for the NI protocol. Um, and those scrutiny arrangements are uh, primarily um, carried out by the Committee of Finance and the Committee of the Executive Office. 
and also then notification, um, as we mentioned at the top of the meeting, from the department that it has issued interim guidance on restraint and seclusion in schools. Um, so are members content to note those items? Yeah, Clark, can I just check when we're likely to receive a briefing from SIA with regards uh, to that consultation? Or if we could schedule it in if necessary as a, an informal meeting, if, if uh, schedules are, are prohibitive? Yeah, we have actually, um, we've written to SIA already to invite them to talk up to, to the committee about um, exams, sorry, what is it, about appeals. Um, the appeals process, yep. Yeah, appeals contingency plans um, and how assessment has been going uh, to date. Um, so provisionally, that's in the forward work programme for the 30th of June. Um, uh, I think that's probably too far away. When, when's the 10-day consultation uh, taking place, Clark? I think it's running from the 10th to the 20th of May. So it's okay. just now. Yeah. And it's mainly school centres, you know, assessment centres who are being asked to respond. I, I don't know what members think, but I think we would need to hear from SIA on appeals earlier than the 30th of June. Ideally, not much later than the the end of May, and if, if that needs to be informal uh, due to schedules, then it, it needs to be informal. Uh, is it, have you, if we're content to agree the rest of the correspondence, should we move to agenda item eight and forward work program, Clark, and then we can consider where SIA might fit into that as well then? Members content yeah. with that? Yes, yeah, sorry? Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, thanks. Okay, agenda item eight members is forward work program. Clark, can we start with saying where we might be able to get See you in there. Okay. Do members have their forward work plan open? Page 68 of the pack. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Um, so um, we haven't confirmed. 26th of May. I got a bit of an opening in it there, Clark. We're hearing from the GTC uh, chair and deputy chair. And then yes. is there a gap there? Um, that's the that's the committee's short meeting, so it's nine to twelve. Um, and I yeah. suppose there isn't anything else scheduled just there because um, there is the likelihood that they, those uh, witnesses might need to or might want to um, give give evidence separately um, from one another. Um, the second of June, maybe. Uh, yeah, the second of June. But I think members wanted not to really schedule more than two sessions in, in any given no, committee. I, did, I heard that feedback uh, last yeah, week. No, we, yeah, no, that, that's sensible. Um, um, okay, well, can we check? Can we check in with the chair and deputy chair of, of GTC and, and, see, and see whether 26th of May is an option? Um, and if it's not, then we might have to consider an informal briefing. Is that okay? Yes. We'll okay, do. members content with that. Okay. Uh, members, any other comments in relation to the forward work program? In table papers today, you'll also see information relating to the Education Committee's proposed youth engagement event. You'll also see a colourful call out for a proposed art project uh, and the scope of focus group discussions with the Education Committee. Uh, which we hope to carry out with a representative cross-section of schools. The title is My Life and Learning in Lockdown. And uh, we'll keep you posted as the progress on uh, submissions that we're receiving to that. Um, any further comment on that, Clark? Um, just so that members are aware that um, not only is the stakeholder event happening by Zoom, which will involve committee members on the 3rd of June, that's at 6.30 to 8.30. Um, but the education service is going to work with 15 schools that it has selected um, to represent all the different school sectors. And um, so their feedback um, on their experience of lockdown um, will, will feed into the virtual event um, with, the, with the committee. Um, also then a, the call out for artwork is to kind of make sure that all age groups um, can be uh, can give their their impressions of this time to the committee, um, and so in June, the early June, um, 
there will be a lot of lovely um I'm, I'm sure very moving um uh, visual art uh some written prose or poetry and um, that the committee will get a chance to have a look at and appreciate and reflect back um to the young people yeah the proposed uh Art call for art is on page one two one of your table pack members. It, I think it looks like a really good idea. As I say, the theme is my life and learning in lockdown. So we're we're hoping that it's a creative way to encourage young people, as the clerk said, of all ages and backgrounds, to express their experiences during lockdown and and to help the education committee to be more informed about those. Okay. Members content to endorse the forward work program then? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Agenda item nine then, any other business? Chair, could I want to raise uh, one issue? Uh, yes, go ahead, Pat. In, in relation to the admission uh, process in primary schools in particular, uh, and I've received some communication in relation to St. Bernard's Primary School in South Belfast. Uh, Paula Bradshaw is probably familiar with it. I'd be surprised if she's not. But it's in relation to oversubscription in that school, and there has been poor communication with uh, parents, which has led to uh, uh, increased anxiety and uh, parents concerned that who had children at the school that their siblings uh, weren't going to also get in. So. I think it's, I'm, I'm not sure how widespread this problem is. I know at, at this time of the year when uh, the admissions uh, are being dealt with that we all tend to get lobbied a lot uh, about different schools. So I think it's important that the, the DEA department works constructively with schools to give parents confidence in the admissions process and to ensure that there's consistency so these issues don't arise. Suppose I'm just... yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I suppose that one swift action might be to um, write to the department and or EA or CCMS to ask um, how any oversubscription at St. Bernard's has been uh, commu communicated and administered. Is it, would that yeah. be some reassurance? Yeah. That would be useful, Chair. Thank you. Yeah. Members content with that action? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Agreed. Okay, mem members, any other business? Nope. Okay, then our, the date and time of our next meeting is Wednesday the 19th of May via Starleaf at 9.30 a.m. The committee does now adjourn. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, bye. Northern Ireland Assembly, committee room 30.